I think every person has one singular thing that, for them, stands tall amongst the crowd as the franchise they hold the most dear from their childhood. And then, as the years rolled by, you find yourself shocked by how much time has passed since then. I'm experiencing that at this very moment because this month, September of 2022, marks the 20th anniversary of Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus, which was released for the PlayStation 2 on September 23rd of 2002. I know I say it all the time, but it just shocks me how much time has passed since then. I mean, a 20-year-old game when Sly Cooper hit the PS2 was Donkey Kong Jr., and gaming had evolved this much in just that 20-year period, and has evolved incredibly in the last 20 years. But for me personally, I have so many memories related to the Sly Cooper series, despite the fact that back in the day there was only just the PS2 trilogy. These games alone were enough to craft unforgettable memory after unforgettable memory. The first Sly Cooper, or Sly 1, or whatever you want to call it, was not the first game in the series I played. That would be Sly 2, which came out in 2004. I mean, I wasn't even two years old when Sly 1 released, so I didn't have the ability to play it then. But still, I just have such vivid memories of getting these games and playing them, and I can still remember what it was like in Target on the day of purchase, what room I was in when I first played the games, what areas I was bottlenecked on, and in this game's case, the joy in seeing the backstories of the characters I had gotten to know in Sly 2. This series is a pretty important part of my identity, which might sound weird to say given the fact that it's just a game about a raccoon, but even down to the way I speak was influenced by Sly. My making videos is partially because nobody talked about Sly on YouTube nearly enough back in the late 2000s and early 2010s. That's the level of importance I hold the Sly Cooper series, too. I mean, I reference Sly in almost every video I do, whether that be mentioning something specific, reciting a line from one of the four games, or just putting something Sly-related on the screen. Sly Cooper is one of my favorite IPs to ever grace the world of gaming. Of course, if you've been following this channel for a long time, you'd know that, and you'd also know this is a weird video because this is quite literally the third time I have taken a crack at reviewing the Sly Trilogy, but I mean, third time's the charm, right? I'm a bit of a perfectionist, and these are my favorite games, so yeah. While I believe the definitive Sly analysis already exists on YouTube, I thought now, the 20th anniversary of this series was the perfect chance to give these games my best effort, creating videos I can look back on and think, yeah, I did a good job with this. But with that ramble firmly established, what even is Sly Cooper? The story of Sly Cooper is directly correlated with the people who made it, Sucker Punch Productions. A studio formed in the late 90s by a group of former Microsoft employees who decided to break into the video game industry together. Their first game, Rocket Robot on Wheels, released on the Nintendo 64 in 1999. I can't speak ill of this game since to this day I've still never played it. Maybe one day I'll get around to it, but I just haven't bothered before. What I can tell you about this game is that it showed the team always wanted to do something interesting, implementing a physics system that got praised by critics upon release. But the game just didn't capture an audience. The Nintendo 64 was packed full of competition in that year alone, but just looking at the game, it doesn't really capture the imagination. It just looks really generic. The subtitle of the game has to inform you of what this guy is even supposed to be. So the game was financially underwhelming due to its inability to grab an audience. But that obviously wasn't the end of Sucker Punch, as they knew they wanted to create a character action game on the PlayStation 2, which was such an enormous leap in capabilities from what could be done on the consoles before then, giving plenty of developers the inspiration to take games to the next level, including Sucker Punch, who now wanted to create a memorable mascot character. I bring up all that info about Rocket, specifically because I think that game's lack of audience response was the driving force behind trying to get the characters and world of their next game right. Great art design is just a fundamental part of Sly Cooper as a game, but that starts at the beginning of development. They knew they wanted a game starring a thief, so naturally they thought a raccoon would be a great animal to base that concept off of, figuring it would be a funny visual for a cartoon raccoon to wear a bandit's mask when that's just what raccoons naturally look like. Evolving this character design over time to go from being a cartoon raccoon into a suave humanoid with raccoon traits. With every depiction of Sly oozing personality in the first game alone, you always see him with a devious grin or up to something mischievous like swiping a wallet, running away with a sack of cash or cracking open a safe or getting away with hiding inside of a barrel, ducking down into the sewers to escape detection, usually being drawn as low to the ground to show he's swift. This time, just by looking at the new character, you couldn't possibly mistake what he was all about. They really nailed the art design of Sly in a general sense, being an appealing character all around. But I also think he was the perfect mascot character for a new age. The early 2000s was when the anti-hero was on the rise. Characters who maybe aren't the good guy, but do good things or are just morally complex. This was true in adult media, and that trickled down into every other corner of the market. Now, everybody wants to play Grand Theft Auto 3 in similarly mature games. Partially explaining why a game like Ratchet & Clank with its super-powered weapons was a lot more popular than Jack & Daxter, which was a more safe and traditional platformer. Those two franchises I've spent a lot of time on in the last year and a half, so you can check out those videos if you want the scoop. But to focus on Sly, I'm just saying that this is the perfect early 2000s mascot, 
I mean, he's cool, he's tough, he's got an instantly identifiable silhouette, and he's also got that trademark 2000s edge about him. He's not moody or mopey or anything like that, he's just a criminal by trade, but one who fights the bad guys. Which serves a double purpose in that Sly can be cool for riding the line between good guy and bad guy, but also allows the game to market a thief protagonist to children as he only steals from the kinds of criminals who'd steal from the innocent. Truly, I think Sly is a perfect character as far as the conceptualization was concerned, and when getting into the game, it's just as well realized. The first 10 minutes of Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus tells you everything you need to know about the character and his world. And I'm sure you're thinking, yeah, silhouettes are mysterious, no shit, scumbag, get to the point. Well, I'm working on it. The intro of Sly 1 uses a pretty basic effect in that Sly's only shown in the shadows, building suspense for the reveal. But man, every playthrough of this game, that opening music, that establishing of the time and tone, Sly executing his moves with perfect precision, it's... it's perfection. Leading to the actual opening level where Sly, for some unknown reason, seeks out a case file at police headquarters where you get introduced to Bentley, techno genius and strategist Supreme, and Murray, part-time driver and full-time burden. As well as Inspector Carmelita Fox, who's been chasing the Cooper gang all over the world to put them behind bars. By the end of the first level, you see all four of the main characters in the series and how they interact with each other. Bentley's a nervous wreck, but also the essential genius. Murray's got the getaway van fired up. Sly is cool, collected, and confident in his ability to break into the police station, dodging lasers like it's nothing, and how he has a banterous relationship with Carmelita. It's all done for the purpose of introducing you to the status quo of this story before you even know who any of these characters actually are and what they're even doing. This prologue lasts like five minutes in total, and yet you now know the gist of the gameplay and characters, so now the game can deliver upon some crucial exposition. <clears throat> Sly Cooper is the latest in a long line of master thieves who specialize in stealing from master criminals. The Coopers document all their secrets in a book called The Thievius Raccoonus, which got stolen away from Sly when he was a kid as five mysterious goons called the Fiendish Five broke in, killed Sly's family, and took the book for themselves to commit dastardly crimes. Sly is left at an orphanage where he meets Bentley and Murray, and then they become best friends and dedicate their lives to tracking down the Fiendish Five, avenging Sly's father and stealing back the Thievius Raccoonus, clearly establishing why the mission is important to our main character, and how what we just did ties into that since the case file you stole in the opening details everything in the five villains you'll be chasing after in the game's five worlds. Together we pledged to track down the fiendish five, avenge my father, and steal back the Thievius Raccoonus. I knew I was about to face the toughest test of my life. On this mission, I would either become a master thief like my ancestors before me, or fail and allow my family name to bite the dust. Within 10 minutes, you're set on an epic quest starring this interesting main character with stakes that are personal to him. It's like this opening was lab-engineered to hook players in. Perfectly paced from the mysterious beginning, the comedic intro of your support team, the action platforming that is easy, but shows the kind of skills Sly has when you play as him, then revealing who stands in your way, and finally what the context is and why you should care. Like I mentioned before, I played Sly 2 before this, but everything being done to perfection like this grabbed me into Sly 1's atmosphere even though the gameplay wasn't structured like Sly 2. And that's thanks to thoughtful character work and pacing. As for what that gameplay is, Sly 1 took heavy inspiration from Crash Bandicoot, the most popular platformer on the PlayStation 1 with its point A to point B level objectives. In particular, the structure from Crash 2 and Crash 3. Each world will open with Sly having to break into the enemy territory in an opening mission where you collect a key at the end, and once inside, you'll see three or so missions open where you run through these levels and collect more keys, which grants access to the most interior area of the base where you collect more keys and more levels until you've unlocked a total of seven keys that grant access to the boss fight, and when you defeat them, the world is done. In the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, you run around jumping over obstacles, having a single attack on Square that kills enemies in one hit, and in return, you die in one hit. But to extend that, you collect 100 coins to unlock a lucky charm that protects you from damage, and then collecting 100 more gives you another one. And each stage has a certain number of collectible clue bottles required in order to get a secret unlockable. These being the most direct comparisons between Sly and Crash, as Sly took a formula that was familiar to platformers but still tried doing it with its own twist. For example, Crash Combat was about choosing if jumping or spinning was the best method of attacking, and doing so with proper timing. In Sly, you can only attack with the signature Cooper Cane. Now it really is all about waiting for the right moment to hit the enemies. Sly's level design is more complex, though. Where Crash had the occasional fork in the road, but the level design was largely about avoiding obstacles as they came up. Sly levels feature more diverging pathways and more verticality, and getting through obstacles at a slower pace, and most importantly, using Sly's agility to get through challenges. Sly definitely took some inspiration from Metal Gear Solid in addition to Crash, since it has all those same MGS staples like peeking over corners, avoiding spotlights, and enemies' FOV. Not to say MGS invented any of that, but my point is that was a popular example of that Hollywood-styled stealth. However, the developers made sure to mention in pre-release that Sly is not a stealth game. Games like Splinter Cell or MGS require a much slower pace where a lot of time is spent deliberately avoiding combat and staying out of sight. This being where the challenge would come from. 
They wanted Sly to be a kinetic platformer like Crash was, but mixed in with beefy elements. That's how they put it. So in this game, you'll be jumping from point to point, but then need to transition into sneaking around a tight corner and avoiding the spotlights and then getting back into the platforming. It really gives you the feeling of being a sneaky character who's good at what he does, while not bringing the pace of the game down. Sly is a simple game when looking at it from a mechanical perspective, but it gets reward out of its mix of crash platforming and light stealth elements. The platforming slowly grows in complexity as the game goes on. After each boss is beaten, you get a major section of the Thievius Raccoonus back and with a full profile on the Cooper ancestor who wrote it, such as the Ninja Spire Jump from Ryuichi Cooper dating back to feudal Japan. This gives Sly the ability to land on tiny points effortlessly, and then the levels need to use this power to get from point to point over pits. At the end of World 2, you unlock the Rail Walk and Rail Slide from Tennessee Kid Cooper, which gives you the knowledge on how to grind on rails and jump from them. Combine that with your ability to land on tiny points and you now have more intricate platforming than you did at the beginning. The game is geared towards replayability since fully completing the game requires you to look throughout each level for 20 to 40 hidden clue bottles that when collected allow Bentley to decipher the code behind the large vault located at the end of every stage. In each one you'll find a page of the Thievius Raccoonus and this will give Sly new abilities. In terms of usefulness, a lot of these don't really impact the game much. Sly's dive attack doesn't really serve a purpose, the basic cane swipe doesn't, and I tried using the hat bomb technique, but it's just too slow to provide a practical use throughout the game, and I only use the decoy to get past enemies that are blocking my way to a stage in World 4. Some of these are pretty OP though, where we find out that some of the Coopers throughout history were so powerful that they could warp reality on a whim. Like the one from Sly's ancestor, B.F. Cooper. Okay, this page is from your hyperactive ancestor, B.F. Cooper. He discovered a way to speed up the clock. Perfect for those long stakeouts. Yeah, I'm just getting bored of this stakeout. Let me invent the ability to increase the speed of time itself. No big deal. Or how Sir Augustine of Cooper just decided to defy the laws of gravity and leap out of pits you fell into. From now on, you should be able to pop right out of those bottomless pits you keep falling into. I don't know, I just found the matter of frank ways in which Bentley says these godlike powers to be really funny. But when getting into moves that are more practical, each world will have an unlockable schematic that shows nearby breakables through your binoculum as orange and nearby clues as green, helping you out if you're stuck trying to find them all. It definitely helped me as a kid, although I don't need it now because I've played the game so many times. Then you also get an unlockable that feeds you information on every guard in the game just by viewing them with the Binocucom. This provides no mechanical use, I just think it's really charming of them to give every enemy a quirky bio. Like these flashlight guards in Ms. Ruby's lair. They like golf. Hope they have fun out there on the weekends when they aren't helping this lady cook up an army of ghosts. The best unlockable in the whole game would be the Raccoon Roll, which grants Sly the ability to roll down hills like he's Sonic the Hedgehog, complete with proper rolling physics. Getting through narrow segments while rolling and then quickly getting out of the roll to fight enemies or jump from point to point is the most satisfying element of Sly 1. And it's pretty much required for the next layer of replayability, the Time Trials. Every platforming stage comes with a timed challenge once you collect everything in it, and if you expected these to be easy, you've got another thing coming. I've said for years that Sly 1's time trials are by far the hardest bits of gameplay in the entire Sly series. The premise is simple, get through the stage in a time limit set by the developers. In order to pull it off, you gotta do it quickly. This means you need to roll as often as possible for the maximum speed at almost every chance you can get, and most importantly, you need to take risks that might not pay off if you're untrained. And I'll give you two examples, both from the first world. In a high class heist, you're going to want to jump around these spotlights when the timing is just right because going the normal route is too slow. Failure will result in getting spotted, which makes the timer go faster, or just dying and having to start the stage again. Another example is in A Cunning Disguise, where I don't take the barrel with me during the level. I jump off of this elevator, start rolling, and bounce off the ground, which gives you enough speed to clear right past the motion-sensing dart guns. Climbing up this bookshelf to skip past most of the second half of the stage, then hoping I can scrounge up enough coins to get a lucky charm to damage boost through the final dart obstacle. You can find examples like that in pretty much every stage. In recent years, perfecting Sly 1 levels from a speed-oriented perspective has made the game really fun to revisit because then you can take advantage of all these little shortcuts like jumping on this exhaust hose and getting on top of the platform that ends the segment instead of playing as intended. It's really rewarding to get right and it makes you feel like a thief god, which is what Sly basically is, but once you have the skills to do it in the game, it's cathartic to pull off. I get the most reward out of going fast in Sly 1 because as I said, this is where the most challenging gameplay is. Not that I'm really the best person to judge how difficult Sly 1 actually is. I mean, as I said earlier, I've been playing this game for almost 20 years. I've played it so many times that I know what a couple of the safe combos are before Bentley even says it to you. For example, the first one is 937. The second one is 792. The last one is 231. You get the picture. I've been around the Sly 1 block a few times. One of my favorite levels to demonstrate that is Murray's Big Gamble in Episode 2. 
you have to provide him with cover fire as he makes a run for the key. And I just so happen to know what spot on the screen the enemies will first appear on. Not trying to flex or anything, but roll the not so humble brag footage. I mean to say that in the moment to moment gameplay, this game doesn't challenge me much, and I can only assume it has a lot to do with exposure, but also because of the way it's designed. The developers said on multiple occasions that they wanted to craft a game where it would be approachable to players of all ages. As a kid, I got my butt kicked by these and every game known to man, but with time, any player could be good at it. The main hurdle being the limited health system that requires you to be careful with enemies and obstacles. So I've embraced the time trials on more recent playthroughs as even with the experience I do have, I still sometimes beat these with literal milliseconds left on the clock. The reward for beating them might not seem super exciting, but I've always thought it was neat. Upon completion, you're granted a designer's commentary for each stage in the game that plays while you play through it. Here you can learn all sorts of things like how they went about lighting different effects at this part of the stage, cut concepts that were going to be used in the levels that never made it in, and just listening to the people who made the game having fun bouncing off each other. It's a unique unlockable that was always interesting to me because I rarely got insight in how the games I liked were made as a kid, so therefore the behind the scenes material in the Sly games were very standout as a result. Not that I beat many of these time trials back in the 2000s, I mean they were way too difficult. But having said that, the reward you get for completing all of them was a behind the scenes video that runs for about 5 or 6 minutes that gives you a lot of insight in the game like how Sly's design evolved, what they were trying to achieve with it, what the PS2 allowed them to do, among other tidbits. Really just makes me wish the Sly Cooper games could get an art book, that would be neat. But that's pretty much it when it comes to Sly 1 as a game, it's a very simple crash styled platformer, however I didn't establish all the things this game did to build character for no reason. Gameplay is just one small element of the Sly 1 experience. The game is backed by a really rich world. The game might have a similar kind of structure to the warp rooms of Crash 2 and 3, but those games were never looking for the kind of world building that Sly has in its environments. Every area is themed to the villain running that territory. Characters who have colors and proportions that contrast with Sly, who visually stands out in each area. Every episode takes place in a different country, as each individual level never misses a beat in fitting in with the aesthetic. Raleigh is someone who has had literally everything he could ever want and is a genius, but uses that to get more stuff and ruin lives. Every element of his character is something you can see in his stages, like the machinery on display in the fire below and into the machine. His vast but meaningless wealth can be seen in his art gallery displaying things for nobody in particular and the library which does the same thing. And then his path as a pirate is seen in the gunboat graveyard where it's covered in wrecked ship parts that have been amassed over the years. Every boss character has examples like that, such as Mugshot's Casino and Racetrack, or Ms. Ruby's Voodoo Egg Beater, Ghost Generators, and Monster Layers all being separate stages. The game gets mileage out of its different locations, is my point. The visuals in this game are also just quite nice. On a technical and animation level, nothing in Sly compares to the first Jack and Daxter or even the first Ratchet and Clank since those were higher budget games with proven studios developing them, however, Sly was nothing to scoff at. Showcasing a variety of different areas that exaggerated real life locations in a way that feels in place with these cartoony animal characters. Sly himself is animated in a really detailed way, such as how he will, when going at the lowest speed, tiptoe around, pulling all his weight back to make as little sound as possible when stepping, or how his tail animates when idle. The look of a cartoon was the thing Sucker Punch wanted to nail the most via shading effects and models that evoke the feeling of an illustration, a cartoon come to life. Not to say it's all popping bright colors or anything. Sly 1 stands out in that it can be quite atmospheric. Ms. Ruby's level being a clear example where the game tries to convey a more dangerous atmosphere with all the creepy supernatural powers all around you. But then levels like the Panda King's Fortress in China also have an isolated atmosphere as you explore a mountain base high above the rest of the city. The music being a core part of selling the vibe of these areas. The whole soundtrack, composed by the late Ashif Hakik, does this across the board, having mysterious, albeit catchy qualities. While the style and sound of Sly Cooper music, for lack of a better phrase, wasn't reached until Sly 2's soundtrack, Sly 1's music did establish trends that the series would carry in all games going forward. Mainly the fact that each track has three versions, the regular track that plays when you run around, a sneaking version that plays while you avoid detection that is quieter and removes many of the core beats, and a danger version that plays when caught that ramps up the tension, the game smoothly transitioning from each one when played. Needless to say, I liked it. The largest thing the first Sly Cooper has going for it is its character writing. 
A story fit for a video game is you have five villains, therefore five worlds to play in as you gradually get the Thievius Raccoonus back, but the way Sly interacts with the various characters will keep you playing the game. The basic description of the character is that he's cunning, suave, and witty, and these respective elements come out at just the right moments. Like his banterous nature being used in his interactions with Carmelita whenever she arrives to put a stop to your activities. As long as you don't mind dining in jail. Nah, I hear the service is lousy. Freeze, raccoon! How can I freeze when my heart warms at the very sight of you? Shut up, ringtail! Or how he pulls out the sarcasm when talking to Bentley, who has the most entertaining dialogue throughout as, despite being a nervous wreck, he throws deadpan sarcasm right back at Sly whenever he gets the chance. I'm 99% sure you'll be able to ride them all the way to the top of that statue before they explode. Hmm. What about that other 1%? Well, in that case, Sly, you will be blown to bits. But the experience will no doubt be spectacular. Nice. And he's just generally the most entertaining character in the game. Sly, see that machine wheel? If my knowledge of mechanical engineering serves me right, applying significant rotational torque to achieve maximum velocity will yield a positive result. You mean something good might happen if I can get the wheel to spin fast enough? Isn't that what I just said? The only one of the main characters that kind of falls flat in this game is Murray. As established, he doesn't do much besides drive the van and get into trouble that plays out via various minigames. And even then, that only happens four times in a campaign with 28 main levels. The player gets a lot of screen time with Sly and Bentley interacting as he gives you mission objectives and tutorial dialogue. For Murray, after you learn who he is, you don't see him again until almost halfway through episode 2. In the greater context of the trilogy, I think Murray's character arc works, but when looking at Sly 1 as a standalone product, his character is one that doesn't provide much to the story and is noticeable whenever revisiting this one. But, to return talking about Sly himself, his interactions with the various villains are my favorite bits of dialogue in the game. One might say it's a bit of a letdown that the villains don't get that much screen time, but I think it works. You learn their backstories at the start of the level, and like I said earlier, each area feels designed to be reflections of those villains' personality. They also come over the intercom and talk to their goons, and you can tell how they are from that alone. Raleigh and Ms. Ruby care not one bit for the guards they employ, but the Panda King always refers to them as valued employees, before talking about their plans to extort villagers for money. But before I make it look like I'm trying to analyze the workplace politics of the Fiendish Five, I'm just saying that every character in the game is pretty well characterized. In his interactions with the villains, Sly acts the most serious. Listen, Raleigh, wipe up my family and steal what's mine, you better expect company. But confident as well. Yeah, well, if he's anything like the rest of you, I think I'll manage. Especially in the bit between him and the Panda King in Episode 4. Sly's goal throughout the game is obviously to get the book back together, but Sly sees the Panda King bury an entire village in an avalanche he caused with his powerful fireworks because they didn't pay protection money. Sly caring more about stopping that than his personal motive. Have you come here for revenge? To steal back the devious Raccoonus? That was my plan at first. But now I'm more interested in putting an end to your avalanche extortion racket. Why should you care if I bury a few worthless village in snow? You are a thief, just like me. No, that's only half right. I am a thief from a long line of master thieves. While you, you're just a frustrated firework artist turned homicidal pyromaniac. He's just a cool character with nuance to his personality and I'm absolutely living for it when I replay this game. This trilogy is, for me at least, one of the most quotable scripts in existence. I think a large part of that is just via the way the actors, in particular Kevin Miller as Sly, deliver their lines. The lines themselves and the way they're delivered in this Sly v. Mugshot scene are a prime example of what makes it so memorable. Like right now, completely off the cuff, I could just be like, You, you know, know, that Fingus Rackamagookus had a lot of nice pictures, but way too many big words. So you don't mind just handing it over? Wow, what, what are you, are you kidding? kidding? You're breaking to my place. Steal my stuff, trash the joint, I feel transgressed and violated. Let's rock. This is just oozing with personality. The characters in World Within the Game have gone to show that already, but then they maximize in that personality at every chance they get. Like how the manual is the Thievius Raccoonus, and instead of just being a clinical description of the game mechanics, it's a conversation between Sly and Bentley about how to play the game. The strategy guide doing the exact same thing. It's the little things like this that show a dedicated effort to craft a memorable series in every aspect. The game was heavily influenced by cartoons, and it uses that influence in-game as every level opens and ends with a 2D comic book style cutscene, narrated by Sly like a graphic novel has come to life. 
each episode getting a title card before you start playing, such as Sly Cooper in The Tide of Terror, or Sly Cooper in Vicious Voodoo, and it's really charming. Comic book tropes like that are an essential piece of Sly's DNA, as the lead artist on the series, Dev Madan, had a background in comic books, having actually worked on the tie-in comics for the DC Animated Universe cartoons. Talk about things coming full circle. It's because of all this personality, story, context, dialogue, and fun core gameplay that Sly Cooper is able to elevate itself far above the issues I do take with the experience. Yeah, Sly 1's not a perfect game. The only major issue I take with the experience is just that Sly 1's platforming content is fun, I just wish it had more of that. In The Tide of Terror, you get six platforming stages and one gimmick level with a twin-stick shooter trying to nab 40 treasure chests before the local crabs get them. This is a fine balance, it makes sense they want to inject some simple variety. Episode 2, Sunset Snake Eyes, has five platforming stages and two gimmick levels, a shooting game and a racing game. But Episodes 3 and 4 both have four real levels and three gimmick stages. While the levels in the back half of the game are good, it almost feels like the areas at the beginning got more of the development time, and then the later levels could only do so much, and so they had to pump them full of gimmicky levels to make the stage count equal between each episode. There isn't even that much to say about the various minigames, though, as the racing one's pretty simple, just boost whenever you can and be taken aback by how much easier the second racetrack is compared to the first one, since the second one just sees the competing AI get tripped up on the ice. And then most other minigames while being presented differently are usually just twin-stick shooters. And while I wish I could say the game gets over that fact in its final level, I can't. The final world of Sly 1 is definitely the weakest in the game. The shame being that it's where the game pays off many things in a satisfying way. Throughout the whole game, the leader of the Fiendish Five is the scariest of all. This opening cutscene for Episode 5, The Cold Heart of Hate, did its job of making me afraid as a kid with the sinister music and imagery of the true villain, Clockwork. We were on our way to the Krakarov volcano in Russia. While looking over what little information I had on the final member of the Fiendish Five, I began to notice something. In the four parts of the Thievius Raccoonus recovered so far, several of the pictures depict a shadowy owl-like figure, which looks very similar to the police images of the mysterious clockwork. Is this a strange coincidence, or is there something I'm missing? But the level itself leaves much to be desired because it's made up of six missions and a boss, but only two of those involve platforming, the rest are shooting and hacking minigames. Especially because if you have two lucky charms, you can just damage boost through most of the first real stage the world has to offer. And it wasn't even that long of a stage to begin with. This is a nitpick, I know, but I also don't like how the currency in this level was not changed from the beta version of the game where you see all the currency is Sly themed. But they realized that collecting sly money in territories that are meant to be places you're raiding and stealing from would be clashing in terms of gameplay and story, so each area has a coin unique to it. Except the final level. Like I said, it just doesn't feel fully realized as an area of the game, but having said that, the story and build-up here is great. Now this being the part where Carmelita first realizes that Sly might not be the thoroughly scummy criminal he seems as he rescues her from Clockwork's death trap so they could team up in taking down Clockwork for good. Bentley also stepped up to save Sly from the same death trap. Setting up for a cool final battle with Clockwork, who it turns out is immortal in his quest to destroy the Cooper legacy. He left Sly alive when he was a kid to show that without the Thievius Raccoonus, Sly would be nothing. But that's when Sly's whole arc is made crystal clear. Ah, well, there's where you're wrong. The Thievius Raccoonus doesn't create great thieves. It takes great thieves to create the Thievius Raccoonus. And you, the player, made that happen by getting better at the game and relying on your allies instead of going it alone. It's Sly's coming-of-age story, and it's the player's journey with the game. I love it. Although the final boss is still not that good. The bosses in this game are all pretty simple, seeing a pattern and attacking when you have the chance kind of thing. Ms. Ruby's being an infamous one to highlight as it was the most major bottleneck in my first several playthroughs, even costing me a few lives today as you have to press buttons and sync with the music. But then the final battle just tosses in a completely new set of mechanics as you play on a jetpack trying to dodge Clockwork's attacks. But I do enjoy the last phase where Clockwork is trapped in the lava and you have to use all your platforming skills you've amassed thus far to reach his head and destroy him for good in a highly satisfying fashion. Once that's done, Sly reflects for the final time in the game, not just about his own goals being accomplished, but also acknowledging that he could never have gotten this far without his friends, bringing the whole game full circle. He and Carmelita are even one step closer to understanding and respecting one another. But for now, the Cooper gang's back to status quo being chased by Carmelita. The end credits also showing that clockwork might not be done for good, setting up for more adventures in the future. 
Especially once the player collects all the pages of the book and gets the extra cutscene where Sly talks about how it's great to have achieved this. What his ancestors inherited, he had to fight for and earn. Just like you seeing this ending after collecting all the extra pages. I'm pretty confident this was the first game I ever beat as well. It was either this or the first Jack and Daxter on PS2. I can't remember which one I completed first since it was relatively close in proximity, but I know for a fact that Sly 1 was the first game I ever got the secret bonus ending out of, really giving it some extra meaning for me. Which speaks for the whole game, really. As I said, Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus isn't the greatest game ever made, if there even is such a thing, but for me, each game in the Sly Cooper trilogy is as close to perfect as I really needed it to be. Back in the 2000s, these were definitely at the top of my list of favorite games, and as I made clear at the top of the hour, it still is that way. Only, over the years, you come to appreciate what really makes Sly special. Its art design, its characters, and most importantly, the vision of the people who made it, and why that unique mix of influences bore such a unique game that while on the surface it's just a good 3D platformer, but in execution is a game that delivers everything you'd want and sets up such a great and interesting mythos. It's just a shame that Sly Cooper was never that popular. I obviously haven't mentioned this fact thus far because it still boggles my mind to this day. Sly Cooper was, of the three platforming franchises on PS2, the one with the most potential to be a big franchise. I mean, it's got a cool and exciting premise, well-designed and equally well-realized heroes and villains that you could keep going for years and years. It came out to pretty raving reviews, it just didn't capture the audience like Ratchet and Clank did, or even as much as Jack and Daxter did the previous year, which already had an issue with getting the audience that team did on Crash Bandicoot before that. I'm sure most 2000 Sly fans can attest to this. If you were a Sly fan, you were probably the only Sly fan in your class, because it just never moved that many units. A story relatable to me and plenty of other longtime Sly fans as I've heard it countless times. I don't know, maybe the box art just looked too vague to make people interested from a glance, something the Greatest Hits release tried to fix. And while each game in the Sly trilogy getting a Greatest Hits release does show the series overall got the recognition it deserved, but at this point I can only say it's a shame because the game is wonderful, despite the small flaws it does have that don't stop me from saying it's an excellent game. One in the pantheon of my favorite games. Not because it's the most challenging and the most fun to play, but because it comes together as an experience so well. Something that, again, goes for the whole trilogy. If I wanted to get all philosophical for this video, I'd pose the question, what's the difference between something being your favorite game of all time and the best game of all time? And also, is there even such a thing as the best game of all time? Now, personally, I don't think there is a singular one-size-fits-all answer to the best game of all time. This is a medium, well, like any art, really, that's wrapped up in tastes and perspectives to make such a declarative statement. So for each individual person speaking for themselves, the line between a favorite game and the best game you've ever played isn't that blurry. Then that brings up other questions about what metrics you're using to make that declaration. As in, are you the type who cares about the competency of the design only, the replayability, what the game means to you personally, or some mix of all of the above? For me, this varies on a game-to-game -game basis. Some games being that deeply meaningful and others just being so well designed and fun to replay that this alone does it for me. I don't even have one singular favorite game, since the question brings in so many different answers to the forefront of my mind. But if there's one constant is that whenever pondering the matter, my mind always goes back to Sly 2, Band of Thieves from Sucker Punch Productions. Sly 2 was first released in the PS2 18 years ago on September 14th of 2004. One of the greatest years in gaming history, if you ask me, just by looking at the sheer volume of all-time classic games that got released then. Sly 2 wasn't the first video game I ever played, however, it was definitely one of the most important. I'm someone who only started playing games because my three-year-old self was jealous that my sister had a Game Boy Advance and I didn't, so I got one and played whatever Scooby-Doo game was on it. My uncle was also big into playing games on his NES like Mario 3 or games on his PS1 like Tekken 2, so I was always interested in and surrounded by computers and games. When we got a PS2 for the first time, it was more of the same. Games like The Incredibles, the video game, and licensed stuff. I had played Jack 2 and Jack 3 before any Sly game, which I had done videos on this summer. Go watch them, they were really good. But as a kid, those games were way too challenging to get nearly as invested as I did with Sly. I won't forget being at Target and then becoming instantly magnetized to the cover art of the game. I didn't set up the fact that I think Sly's a well-designed character in the previous video for no reason. I was immediately drawn to him the second I saw this box art with Sly's charming self grinning front and center. I have framed posters all over my room of the games and other media I found the most meaning in, and Sly 2's cover art is one of them. Without Sly Cooper, and Sly 2 specifically, I don't think I'd be where I am today. 
or even the same person. This game, for all the reasons I'll discuss today, made me into someone who appreciated video games on a deeper, creative level, teaching me that games could be something more than what I had already seen and experienced thus far. So, the challenge of doing this video is the same as Sly 1 and Sly 3, multiplied by a factor of 10, because this isn't just the third time I'm doing this game in the last seven years, it's also my third time trying to explain why this game is one I hold so dear after almost 20 years of playing it, replaying it, thinking about it, and all that. I suppose the pressure is self-inflicted. I guess if I succeed, it's up to you guys in the audience. So with that established, it's time to get started. And what's a better way to get going than by picking up where we left off last week? Sly 1 was, and still is, an incredible game. An inspiring effort from an up-and-coming game dev, working hard to create a phenomenal character and an interesting world to go along with him. It's an experience that I could go back to any day and have a good time with. It's got such a great atmosphere, memorable story, and solid gameplay. The only areas it got flack in were that it was too short, which I definitely agree with. Well, maybe the game itself wasn't too short, the issue was the content which was becoming less and less consistent as the game went on, making the game feel like it peaked too early. Be that as it may, I do love me some Sly 1. Always have, and I always will. The game did get a plethora of praise as a result of its characters and world building. And Sly 1 thankfully sold well enough to be worthy of a sequel, and when looking at everything pertaining to this game, one of the things most clear about it to me, right after looking in depth on the first game, was how they zeroed in on what the appeal of the Sly Cooper series was, making it even more appealing than they did before. Many of my early talking points will focus on this idea of refining an already solid vision. One of the words they used when promoting Sly 1 was that they were trying to make the game as thiefy as possible. They defined that as anything and everything that makes the player feel the most like a thief. Whether that be dodging spotlights or stealing treasure. But for this game, they wanted an entire gameplay model that revolved around the idea of making the player feel like a thief, crafting a structure that would feel unique to the Sly Cooper series. They wanted Sly 2 to feel like a cartoon heist film. The opening minutes of the game made a promising pitch. This time, as the game box promises, the entire Cooper gang is involved with this massive break-in on a museum in Cairo. The prologue being this mission. It's serving multiple purposes. Obviously giving the player a non-threatening way to get into the mechanics of the game. Although on that note, on my first playthrough, it took me what felt like forever to realize you had to jump on this thing here to make progress right at the beginning. Although, that's going off of the attention span of kid me, so it's probably like two minutes. As I was saying, the prologue shows that the payoff of every level in the game was going to be a big collaborative mission between the Cooper gang members who would all provide an essential role in the task being accomplished. Here, we see Bentley hacking into the computers to get Sly past security, and Murray using his abilities to create an entrance for Sly to use. What also warrants discussion is that plopping us back into the story allows the game to reintroduce us to these characters, Sly being as cool, collected, and confident as ever. No, Sly, I'm the wizard, and you're sitting duck. I read you loud and clear, lizard. No, I, I'm... forget it, you're not taking this seriously. Yeah, I'm not. Bentley getting out into the field for the first time to do the kinds of things Sly and Murray just can't, being more nervous than usual. Murray getting the biggest overhaul. His character was easily the lowlight of Sly 1 from a writing standpoint, since he just got pushed to the sidelines while they were developing the game. So by the end, he just felt... there, not really adding much to Sly's world besides being a goof. So now, they decided to change it for the better. Make Murray, the hippo, the muscle of Sly's crew. I mean, Sly's the leader, an agile raccoon thief, Bentley's the brains, a turtle whose whole arc is coming out of his shell. Why not make the hippo the strong one? By creating these solid archetypes that each member of the team excels in, it allows every member of the Cooper gang to feel distinct and complementary to one another at the same time. Each one has strengths and weaknesses the others do not. Extra important because you're going to be playing as all these guys. However, it doesn't feel like a rewrite of Sly 1, just an expansion on the foundation that game laid. The first Sly was mostly about establishing Sly as a character, his motivations, his backstory, and his growth on that mission. Sly 2 is about those things as well, but now that Sly's origin is said and done, it's easier to integrate the rest of the crew more, also building off of what was there. I mean, Bentley never had to step up before he needed to save Sly from Clockwork's death trap, so naturally, that would increase his confidence a little bit. What was there in Sly 1 was that Murray wanted to be like Sly, but obviously didn't have the skills or bravery to do it. By the end, he had also dabbled in the missions a bit, channeling all his will to be cool like Sly in his new persona and design as the Murray, the powerhouse of the Cooper gang. Props to the team at Sucker Punch for still having Chris Murphy continue to play Murray, even with this different direction for him. It's improving Sly 1 while feeling natural at the same time. The prologue of Sly 2 being an exciting hook to get players into it, Sly 1's being a bit short in hindsight compared to 2 where you have funny lines and bits, different character interactions, and this big bombastic chase scene with the whole gang getting away from Carmelita and then the entire squad of police to this action-packed music. With an intro like that, I'm now invested. 
I mean, I had never played anything like it before. A mix of feeling sneaky, pulling off this big job with characters this stand out, with all the action you'd expect from a cool video game like Sly busting through the window and running from rooftop to rooftop, dodging Carmelita's shots while Bentley and Murray are in a high-speed chase down in the ground. It's pretty cool leading to the first animated scene that establishes the context. Two years have passed since Sly defeated Clockwork in Sly 1. However, his robotic pieces have been salvaged by a museum and the Cooper gang set out to steal them to make sure Clockwork could never return. But they learn from Carmelita and the new Interpol agent, Constable Neela, that the parts were already stolen by a mysterious group called the Claw Gang. The Cooper gang's mission is to track them all down and destroy Clockwork once and for all. I don't know what's in my future, but I won't let it be a repeat of my past. Already from the start of Sly 2, so many things are better than they were in Sly 1. I don't mean for this to be a, here's a list of things Sly 2 does better than 1 video. I suppose it's natural given that this is a sequel and you'd want to compare them, but I'm just saying that I don't want Sly 1 to seem like it's not good. I just spent 32 minutes last week going into why I thought the game was so great. My aim is really just to show why I think Sly 2 is such a good refinement of the brand, Sly Cooper. Another example are these cutscenes. Sly's comic influences were evident in the last game, but while editing that video, I couldn't help noticing the motion elements in those cutscenes just look kinda... cheap. Like how this image of Sly is used here and then is then panned across the screen with a different background layer. With Sly 2, the art style is much cleaner, actually resembling what you'd see in mainstream comics. The characters look more on model, especially Sly himself who had these yellow gloves and black shoes in the Sly 1 cutscenes, despite that obviously not being what his final design looked like. And generally, I think the motion elements of these comic book cutscenes look more cinematic. And less stock. Just higher production value across the board. This is also a thing outside of the animated scenes, as the cutscenes in-game are better with different camera angles from the usual A-cam, B-cam, and more movement. The actual animation in the characters is still nothing to write home about, relying on a couple of pre-baked animations that the game reuses repeatedly throughout. So it doesn't compare to Jack 2 or Ratchet and Clank 2, which both released the previous year, or the games in those series is that released alongside Sly 2, but I think this more than gets the job done, showing how the team had evolved from the development of Sly 1. Something that's seen most clearly when discussing the game's structure. One of the lines that's always stuck out to me from the behind the scenes movie was when Chris Bensel said, This game we really wanted it a lot more to be about doing something rather than just going somewhere. And as a result, one of the things we really focused on this game was to really work on the AI. The first Sly was a straightforward point to point B platformer in the same vein as Crash Bandicoot. As I went over in the Jack 2 video, many of the older game design tropes weren't as popular in the early 2000s with games like Grand Theft Auto 3 ruling the roost. Sly 2 wasn't as obviously inspired by GTA 3 like Jack 2 was, but it did take this linear gameplay and adapt it into a mission-based sandbox style. The Sly Cooper twist is how the game wanted to arrange these missions to be like a heist movie. Each of the eight areas see the Cooper gang in a different location as you must do several missions to set up a grand heist at the end of every stage. The first episode is my favorite example, where you begin by taking some recon photos as Sly to get the layout of Dimitri's operation for Bentley, and then you have to tail Dimitri as Sly to learn the passcode for the aqua pump room so Murray can sabotage it in another mission, or how Bentley has to drop the giant disco ball in order to create a massive enough impact to shake the nightclub's front peacock sign loose from its moorings. That's not every mission you do in the first level, but my point is made. Each mission ties into each other as you gradually prepare for the massive heist where all three characters work together to pull off the big job, paying off the little ones you'd done before. Like Operation Hippo Drop, where Bentley uses his bombs to destroy the bridge to Rajan's guest house so that the guards will be lured there. Sly then distracts the crowd in the ballroom by wearing a disguise and dancing with Carmelita. And with that distraction in place, Murray can drop in from the ceiling to get the clockwork wings from the statue they're displayed on. I just used Episodes 1 and 2 as an example, however, every mission in the game serves a purpose to the larger heist that episode ends with. I just love when a game makes all the things you do feel important, even if some missions are arbitrary like destroying this elephant-powered satellite array in Episode 3. Guess this mission didn't need to exist from a gameplay perspective, but in the story at least, Rajan is using this to collect data on the Cooper gang, giving it an urgent feeling, allowing the devs to set up the fact that the spice the Claw gang uses makes people really aggressive. Although, I suppose I can return to that later. The thing I find most appealing about the way Sly 2 is structured is that there's no game quite like it. Large open spaces obviously existed in other games, but not ones where the little missions saw you trade off between equally cool and skilled characters to pull off a big heist requiring all their skills. It's definitely effective at feeling like a heist movie, something no game was ever really trying to do before. So its gameplay is unique to Sly Cooper and heavily fits the series rather than standard level-to-level -level action. The eight mini hub worlds you explore are solidly designed as well. 
The developer stated in an interview with GameSpy that they designed each area to be like Disney World, where areas are centered around memorable focal points that are always in view. I think each of the hub worlds are all the proper size and scale with, as the developers promised, memorable landmarks that make it easy to orient yourself in regards to where you are. Such as the re-education tower in episode 5 standing tall above the rest of the buildings so you know where you're going to be going from that alone. Although missions are clearly marked with the holographic markers that go high in the sky with the press of the L3 button for extra guidance. And if you want more exploration, you can collect the 30 clue bottles hidden in each area that are satisfying to get as you always have to explore every nook and cranny to find them all. Sometimes you might get stuck in the last two or three, which might feel annoying in the moment. However, once you get them all, you look forward to the reward, which is always a useful upgrade to Sly's abilities, like a fast electric spin that kills enemies in one hit, or the long toss, which allows the characters to toss things further away than you could before. Speaking of those characters, in this game you'll be playing as Sly, Bentley, and Murray. To start with the leading man, Sly is very similar to how he played in Sly 1. He retains all the major platforming abilities learned in that game, but has expanded combat to include an uppercut that leads to a takedown on unsuspecting enemies and a charged spin attack. What's different from the last game is that you can control the camera freely with the right analog stick. The first game only allowed you to move the camera left and right because you wouldn't really need to be looking up and down in the linear levels that Sly 1 had. Here you'd need to be seeing what's above and below you to properly get around the areas. But as for the mechanics, Sly feels much better to jump around as. In the first game, when jumping, you were pretty much committed to that jump. The only thing you could do to change that trajectory was using the double jump and pulling the stick back to stop forward momentum. In Sly 2, it just feels much less restricted when jumping as you can jump forward, but double jump into a backflip or a side jump. Just makes Sly feel much more agile. All the characters can sprint by holding down R1 just at the cost of alerting guards to your whereabouts. I always remember the sprint because of the fact that when starting the game for the first time, I recall thinking the default speed was kinda slow and thought there must be a way to go faster. I couldn't consult the manual because I could barely read, so my mom had to read it for me. And the exact moment we did that was when this happened. Why you can hold down the R1 button while walking to break into a fast run, but be careful, as this is sure to be loud enough to alert any guards in the vicinity. The timing of that was just always something funny I'll remember about that first playthrough. So when looking at the other two characters, how they were going to handle was the biggest mystery going into slide two. The devs simply stated that their goal was to make all three of them fun to play and have missions and make the player feel like their inclusion was necessary. Therefore, all three characters basically play the exact same with minor differences between them. For example, the control scheme is the same between all three playable teammates. So if you know how to play as Sly, you can easily play as Murray. Sly is the only one who can climb on things and run on ropes and such, with good, albeit not great, combat ability. Missions for Sly are the ones requiring these skills, like tailing someone from the rooftops or pickpocketing something. Bentley is the weakest on the team, taking the longest to defeat all the enemies you come across, which makes avoiding them the most important thing. But without the agility of Sly, you rely on his gadgets to make up the difference as Bentley uses his dart gun to put enemies asleep from a distance so he can get by them or uses bombs to blow them away. He focuses on missions needing demolition or computer hacking skills. Murray is the strongest of the group, so the stealth is the least important for him. Without exception, Murray can kill every enemy in two hits. And it feels really fun to do as every punch you land causes the controller to vibrate so you really feel the impact. Even more than the Batman 66 POW and BAM texts that appear on defeated enemies already did. Murray doesn't really have much going on when playing him besides that. Missions focusing on destroying something heavy, defeating enemies, or moving something large from one spot to another. While it sounds very simple, and it is, I suppose, Sly 2 balances it all well, though. Sly is the character you'll play as for a majority of the game. He's the main character and the most fun to play as, after all. In Episode 3, there are eight missions before the heist. Five of them star Sly. Two of them star Bentley, and the last one is for Murray. While Bentley's total mission count sounds low, most of his missions are pretty long and involve platforming and hacking computers, so you definitely don't feel a loss there. Murray's the character you'll play as the least in the game because his gameplay is the most simple, however, for the most part, it doesn't feel like you're missing out since every time you do play as him, it's explosively cathartic as you pummel the enemies in your path, when most of the game is sneaking around as Sly and Bentley. I'm not saying there isn't room for improvement, as Murray definitely could have used, say, two missions per level, but the way it is in Sly 2 works well. Sly is also the most useful when getting around the levels. As I said, he's the only one who can interact with pipes and ropes and such, meaning he can get around in more fun ways than Bentley and Murray who have to go on the ground or get up on the rooftops via other means. So playing as them less helps with reducing commutes between missions. Although you do get some useful upgrades to help out with this. The clue bottles aren't the only path to upgrades in this game, as they added an entire system for it that once more makes the player really feel like a thief. Sly can now pickpocket guards for their loose change, and if their pocket is shining, they can swipe valuables off of those guards. At the safe house, the player can use Bentley's computer to access ThiefNet, where you sell your stolen goods in exchange for more coins. 
In the hubs, you can also find treasure you can bring back to the safe house to sell for a much higher value. You spend all these coins, not on lives and hit points because Sly 2 removed lives and gave every character a health bar. Instead, you spend them on useful upgrades like Sly's smoke bomb, which instantly ends the alert phase if you get caught, provided you can get away before the enemies catch you again. Sly has a couple upgrades that are required for progression, such as the alarm clock gadget at the end of Episode 7 to distract the judges at the Lumberjack games, and best of all, the paraglider required in Episode 5 that Sly uses to glide through the air and extend his jumps with. A series stable because of how simple and effective it was in Sly 2, giving every area a sense of scope as you can take it all in from high above the ground. For Bentley, nothing is required, but there are some good ones like the sleep bombs that come in handy when crowded by a lot of enemies, or the ones that brought on this discussion in the first place. Bentley's Adrenaline Burst that makes you move much faster for a few seconds, and his Hover Pack that grants Bentley temporary flight, albeit with a short duration and a low speed, but it can get you up to higher areas without having to take the long way around. Murray's stuff isn't super useful, though. The Fists of Flame kill enemies in one hit, and his other upgrades all make destroying enemies more fun and varied, although you can get through the game without all that. The only one that really comes in handy is the Atlas Strength, which allows Murray to sprint and jump while carrying things. It makes the missions like capturing General Clawfoot, these bear cubs, and luring old Grizzleface much simpler. The game gives you a contrast with this since you're forced to complete the Ruby Exchange mission in Episode 3 without this upgrade since it's not unlocked until later. So when it is, you feel the incentive to buy it. You'd hope Murray's launch move would be as useful as Bentley's hover pack, but this one is quite lame. Murray just looks like he's passing gas and uses that to propel himself in the air, just with the pitiful distance compared to what Sly and Bentley could do. So that one was a dud that could have been much better, but besides that, this is a solid roster of upgrades that gives players something to work towards throughout the game outside of the core missions. Having said that, Sly 2 is already well on its way to being a good game with its premise, its art design, brandability, structure, and gameplay. But the glue that holds this game together is its story. Sly 1 was a pretty simple story arc that suited its gameplay-focused design well. Each level, you'd be introduced to the villain, go through some stages to stop them, and then move on to the next one until the day was done. Game had clear character arcs, but I'm saying that structurally it's predictable. Sly 2 is a pretty subversive sequel. With that said, it's important to establish what your expectations are before I can talk about them being subverted. Sly 2 starts off pretty much the same as the first game. We have new characters to play as, a new competing law operative love interest in Constable Neela, who's willing to actively help Sly and friends out if it means getting her own job done, and the game has all this gameplay to get to grips with. So the first level is dedicated towards getting the players used to all the new dynamics at play in Sly 2 while being set up like a Sly 1 level. Dimitri is the villain. You spend several missions finding a way into his printing press room. You beat him up, get the clockwork tail feathers, and the Cooper gang gets away as Carmelita arrives after the fact to toss him in jail. Episode 2 begins with the same idea. Rajan is our villain. He's got the clockwork wings, and we have to get to them while they're at display in front of a crowded ballroom. I remember on the first playthrough, I was expecting it all to end with a boss fight with Rajan, and we move on to the next level, except things don't play out like that. The Cooper gang pulls off the mission and escapes with the clockwork wings, however, Rajan escapes from the premises. So while the cutscene still ends with goofy antics with the gang like always, Sly is left with a feeling of dread as Rajan is still at large. I was happy the guys got to unwind, but Rajan was still out there. And somehow, I knew things were about to get tough. So now, who knows how this game is going to be structured? Anything could happen next. Episode 3 sees the gang track Rajan to a rundown temple base in the jungle where he's keeping hold of the clockwork heart. The whole heist built up to this moment where Sly and Neela take on Rajan, only for her to be on his side. Neela, now! Sorry. What are you doing? As Sly gets injured, leaving Murray to battle Rajan, which is this huge moment for him to show just how strong he actually is. The boss with Rajan is one of my favorites because you can just toss his guards right at him, causing him to fall over, and you can then pick up Rajan, just chuck him right at the electric fence. It's pretty cathartic. But then, Neela walks in with Carmelita and the Contessa, our high-ranking prison warden of Interpol. They're there to capture Sly, Murray, and Rajan and toss them all in jail. To make matters more surprising, Neela uses Sly tricking Carmelita into being part of their dance distraction scheme against her and frames her for being in league with the Cooper gang. So Carmelita is now getting tossed into the slammer alongside Sly and Murray. This moment will live on in my mind rent-free for the rest of my life. Sly 2 completely changed my expectations for what video games were. I think this is one of the first plot twists I had ever seen. Normally, kids media, including Sly 1, would follow a simple arc. But this game was the first time I saw a story where characters can go from being on your side to not. This made me rethink everything I had seen. Neela wasn't helping Sly at all before, she was setting the gang up for this moment. 
shaking up the status quo even more by tossing Carmelita into the slammer. Back in episode 2, Sly used Neela to distract the crowd halfway through as a practice round for when he does it with Carmelita later. Neela, knowing this, and pointed it out. Are you using me to get at old Ironsides? Yes, I am. Do you mind? Not at all. And she was totally okay with it because then she knew she'd use this opportunity to frame Carmelita and get her out of the picture. It's like, wow, layers upon layers. Sly is the personification of cool, and yet he's been emotionally duped. No one likes to have their affections played with. I know I certainly don't. Look, Neela, as soon as this India job is over, why don't you and I go out on the town? We'll dance through Bollywood and eat curry all night long. I'll keep in mind. Episode 3 shows that Sly has started to have some genuine feelings for Neela that she continued to exploit. And... And we're on for that date in Bollywood. Knowing she was going to betray Sly immediately after. I mean, how shocking is all that if you've never seen a story go in a direction like that before? I mean, there was the second season of Justice League, but I was so young that I could barely understand what was going on. I just liked the superheroes. This was something you had to actively be engaged with, and it took me totally by surprise. Now I have literally no idea what direction the story is going in, and it's for the better. Because of how well written the game is, you want to see what happens to the characters. Sly may be the title character, but Bentley is definitely the star of the show. He went from zero fieldwork to being out there alone in Sly 2, and the writers didn't skip a beat. At the beginning of the game, once he's the one who actually has to do a mission, his usual tone, I share in your enthusiasm, but before we hit the inside, we'll need to do a little reconnaissance work, is completely different. Hey Bentley, how you holding up out there in the field? Fine. Fine, I'm just fine. I just need to bob all the pillars supporting that disco ball and I can get out of here. What's with taking out the disco ball? Its impact will shake the nightclub's front peacock side loose from its morning. Look, I can't talk now, I've got to keep moving, keep safe. On that note, the way he explains missions to Murray is different from how he does to Sly. There are three of them out here and I need you to take them out. Gotta appreciate the little details like that. As I was saying, once it's been established that Bentley's uncomfortable with field work, you start to root for him as he comes out of his shell more. Great field work, Bentley. You're really getting the hang of this. As we're then met with this plot twist where Sly and Murray are sent to jail, you're now just like, what on earth is gonna happen now? But then the cutscene goes from kinda sad to pretty exciting. The long walk out of the jungle gave me time to reflect. And with each passing step, my sense of isolation grew. Shockingly, my comrade's absence had a profound emotional effect on me. This was it. This was the true test of friendship. Upon reaching the van, my resolve was hardened. I had to save my friends. But first things first, I had to learn how to drive a stick shell. You get an entire level dedicated to Bentley as a solo operative, trying to break Sly and Murray out of the Contessa's massive prison. This being a perfect time to bust out the horror level tropes as it's supposed to be scary. Jail is not a thief's preferred place to hang out, after all. But then you're also playing in this hostile environment as the weakest character in the game as a part of his growth towards being confident on the field. When Bentley does rescue Sly, it's a cute moment because like I said, you like these characters by this point, and they make it a quiet moment that pays off Sly making fun of Bentley's code names from the beginning. Wow, you've really thought of everything. Don't I always? Yeah, you do. Thanks for busting me out. Oh, well, you know the old saying, if you can't count on a friend to bust you out of jail, what kind of a friend are they? Truer words were never said, wizard. Things get a bit serious though as Murray gets transferred to solitary confinement and is made the guinea pig for the Contessa's mind control and a test subject for the spice the Claw Gang uses that, as was foreshadowed in episode 3, makes you go into a fit of uncontrolled rage. Now, the local spice plants are illegal for good reason. Eat too many, and you'll go into a fit of uncontrolled rage. Keep that stuff away from Murray. Now this has happened as you need to snap him out of it. The team then trying to chase the Contessa down for revenge until she gets away. Don't worry, pal. We'll find her. With the three of us back together, she doesn't stand a chance. The ending cutscene of episode 4 having nothing to do with the clockwork parts of the Contessa or whatever, the game put in all this effort to make the characters and their relationships come first. So therefore, this scene is all about how happy it is to see the team fully reunited again after that prison level. This made the characters feel real to me as a kid. 
The fact that the game takes its time to build up to things and pay them off, have quiet moments, action scenes, funny lines, and serious moments, it's all the makings of a great story. Although I guess I haven't said too much about what the plot is. I gave the basic description much earlier in the video, I just mean that I haven't gotten the chance to talk about how great the villains are in Sly 2. I already liked the rogues gallery in Sly 1, but this just blows that game out of the water. For starters, the villains are actually working together. Dimitri ran a nightclub where the spice was distributed to the Paris public. Rajan made the spice, the clockwork heart being used as an unlimited source of energy powering his spice grinder. The Contessa also being a member of the Claw Gang, as it's revealed that she used her position as a prison warden to brainwash criminals into telling her where they've stashed their loot, further enriching herself, and is using her hypnotic suggestion knowledge to aid the Claw Gang. Then you have Jean Bassan, who uses his massive shipping empire to deliver spice all over the globe. All this being orchestrated by the mysterious Arpeggio. The Cooper Gang has walked into a full-on criminal conspiracy in this game, one that the developers masterfully crafted. Further showing the player's actions having an effect on the world, like how the Contessa complains that spice shipments are way down as a result of the Cooper Gang stopping Dimitri and Rajan, killing both production and distribution. The villains themselves also feel more real as well. The Claw Gang members don't even like each other that much, like how Jean Bassan, at Rajan's ball, throws shade at the spice production. That fellow is very graceful. If only you moved spice shipments as well. Oh, silence. Or how an intellectual like Arpeggio clearly thinks Jean Bassan is a dullard when talking to him over the phone. Top to bottom, it's a well thought out story. Besides the Panda King and Clockwork, I don't think Sly 1 was trying to make its villains anything more interesting than a funny or quirky boss character, but in this game though, you get these backstories and motivations from the villains that are really compelling. Such as Rajan, who grew up poor and sold illegal spice to gain massive amounts of wealth, and was at first trying to show the world how opulent he was by throwing a massive ball, but the Cooper gang ruins that and his reputation as well. So in episode 3, we see him as the crazy thug he actually is. The Contessa married a wealthy aristocrat and poisoned him to get his entire estate for herself, really making her one of the most menacing villains in the game as she'll stop at nothing to get her goals accomplished. And then you have Jean Bassan, who has a really creative backstory. He was a prospector back in the gold rush in the 1850s, but was frozen in an avalanche for over a hundred years, and now global warming has thawed him out, so he's continuing his mission to level trees in the interest of commerce like he did way back when. Sly even acknowledging that in his day, that wasn't considered a bad thing. The writer's going as far as to make Jean Bassan racist, too. The Cooper gang installs a bug in his house, and you can listen to his thoughts at the safe house. He claims that Rajan knows how to throw a party, despite being a foreigner. This is more blatant with his contempt for Bentley because he's a turtle. Although, if I'm talking about bigger themes, the Claw Gang's whole scheme is essentially the drug trade. It's dolled up and presented in a kitty way as they ship spice across the land and distribute it to paying customers. However, Rajan's backstory is that he went from rags to riches selling this illegal, addictive garbage, it having an effect on your mental state. Rajan, when you listen to the bug you planted in his office, decides to get a hit when he's stressed out. It's literally R-rated material in this game if you just change the details around and made it an AMC drama. With heroes you care about and villains that are pretty well characterized, I'm hooked. The actual writing of the dialogue is a big help with that, of course. Last week, I said the way I speak was influenced by Sly, and can you blame me? I could listen to the internal monologue of trilogy-era Sly any old day because they wrote him to be really well-spoken, despite his banterous nature. As a kid, I was enthralled with Sly, even though he was saying words I didn't understand the meaning of. Like in episode 1's opening when he's like, Dimitri now runs a nightclub on the west side. The thumping music, colorful light shows, and a hint of danger lure in chic young patrons from far and wide. Or one of my favorites is when he's talking about Rajan, he says, And while he goes to great lengths to convince others of his royalty, it's mostly to convince himself. True to form, he's holding a lavish ball in his newly purchased ancestral palace. The reason? To show off his latest acquisition, the clockwork wings. I could go on all day with that, but my point is that growing up with these games, it was a thing for me to look up what some of these words meant and use them in conversation. Others I just sort of understand the meaning of just by looking at the surrounding context. The game is full of examples like that in monologues, serious moments, and comedic ones. Of course, Kevin Miller's delivery as Sly is a massive part of that. I mean, he doesn't have to bust out the thesaurus for me to be hanging on his every word. It can be as simple as, It's a well-fortified gothic nightmare that would make any thief run in terror. Terrible or not, that's where we're headed. Which is the note episode 5 begins on as the Cooper Gang walks into a full-scale war. The Contessa was exposed as a member of the Claw Gang, so Neela got the cash allowance to wage war on her. The Cooper Gang needs to get into the mix of the battle to get their hands on the Clockwork Eyes, which the Contessa is using to try and brainwash Carmelita. The game doesn't hide the fact that this journey's become personal for so many of its characters and with different relationship conflicts colliding. 
the Cooper gang trying to fight both Neela and the Claw gang at once, and now Carmelita has to deal with being a fugitive herself once she's rescued by Sly. More adamant than ever that she needs to capture Sly to prove her own innocence, while Neela keeps rising the ranks of Interpol despite her mysterious allegiance. I am quite fond of this game, its character arcs and drama, which it has in abundance. Episode 5 feels like a big halfway point climax as by the end the Cooper gang just barely pulls the clockwork eyes heist off in the middle of a war zone. The main theme of the game plays in the menu, and starting in episode 5 you get this variant with more instruments to complement the ascending stakes. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the word that really fits the point I'm conveying, but I'm trying. I've said before I'm pretty musically illiterate, so I tend to avoid the subject. I'll just say this, I don't listen to Sly music much, but it's all great. Starting in Sly 2, Peter McConnell's the main composer of the games, and he found this sound for Sly music that has this perfect noir feel to it that became the main musical style of the series throughout Sly 2, 3, and 4. Of course, I'm now obliged to mention that the game is not without flaws. In terms of gameplay and story, I really like Episode 6, where the Cooper gang disrupts Jean Bassan's iron horse trains to get the clockwork stomach and the two clockwork lungs that he was using to power those trains unlimitedly. Fun fact from me was that I was taken aback by this being a snow level. It takes place in Canada, but when I was like four years old, I didn't know where Canada was or what that was, so when I heard, Jean Bassan, a member of the Claw Gang and Canadian shipping baron, he owns half the trains in Canada. I got the image in my mind that it was going to be a beach level, and I got the exact opposite. Train heists are a pretty cool set piece in movies and games, so the level has that going for it. However, the writing does take a dip here, because the Cooper gang fully knows Neela's evil at this point, so they decided to just, for this level only, turn her into a mustache-twirling maniac when she's a cool, collected manipulator for the entire rest of the game. But then you get to Episode 7, which is one of my least favorites to play. Primarily because of the hub world being designed with this massive pit in the ground that makes Bentley and Murray always have to take the long way around. And by this point in the game, we've been going on for like seven and a half hours, and so the routine of recon mission, pickpocketing mission, carrying stuff, hacking into computers, it's probably going to start feeling a little played out for a lot of players, since they aren't doing much to minimize the monotony by this point. But luckily, the story ramps up in yet another jaw-dropping moment when I first played this game. The Cooper gang tries scamming Jean Bassan out of the clockwork talents he was using to level trees with ease. But they get caught and captured. As Bentley drops down in the next room to find Jean Bassan, where it's revealed that while the gang was unconscious, he and his goons found and raided their hideout, stole all their clockwork parts, and sold them to Arpeggio, who can now use them to rebuild clockwork. The goal the gang was trying to prevent for the entire game. That, combined with the anti-turtle racism, gets Bentley fired up for a Jean Bassan v Bentley boss fight of leading him into traps and telling Sly which ones to activate from the console he was standing next to. It's one of the coolest moments in the story, as the obvious muscle of the claw gang gets beaten by Bentley. Like, that's just so genius. Once again, brains triumph over brawn. By this point, Bentley's arc of confidence is complete. For now. The victory is short-lived because all the parts are stolen, and as the gang stows away to get access to Arpeggio's blimp, there's no positive way to put a spin on it for the team. Our clockwork parts were gone. Looking around the inside of the battery, I knew we all felt it. Failure. They screwed up, and now all their hard work is in jeopardy, leading into the final level. This is another one I don't really like that much. I'd say it's better than the last level of Sly 1, where the game basically admitted defeat and gave you an onslaught of minigames to survive, but in Sly 2, the last level is still not that fun. I like the atmosphere. The final level doesn't take place in a burning volcano or some other obvious climactic setting. It's instead an airship, with nothing but endless clouds and stars as the backdrop, with music that feels somewhat tranquil, but sinister at the same time. The main problem with the last level is just that, while in concept the Cooper gang working together on regular missions makes the level feel more climactic, it doesn't really land when you have to pickpocket as Sly, again, hack computers as Bentley, again, and destroy boxes as Murray, again. After an entire campaign of doing that same kind of mission at least once an episode for the last several episodes. That, and the blimp is so big that the commute between areas is really long if you don't know how to time your jumps right. So the last level, whenever I get to it now, is more of a, yeah, I already played this much of the game, why would I not finish it? The climax draws further heat from fans as we find out that the clockwork frame is entirely rebuilt as we then learn that Neela was working for Arpeggio the whole time, working with and betraying whoever she needed to in order to achieve their goals of bringing back clockwork. 
Arpeggio then explains to Sly in painstaking detail about how Dimitri's nightclub distributed Rajan's spice to an entire city, and how the Contessa helped him set up hypnotic technology powered by Northern Light Energy Jean Bassan collected for Arpeggio. The main man himself didn't really care about the trivial schemes of his cohorts, but needed their help for the larger plot, knowing Sly would take them down and recover the clockwork parts, lucking out that Jean Bassan found and sold him the parts in the last level. The plan being to use enough hypnotic suggestion to activate the spice in the Paris public to cause them to go insane with rage like Murray did in episode 4, thus causing enough hate to bring clockwork back to life. I just described the entire plot of the villains just now, and the game made sure to explain it all, leaving no room for ambiguity. Although while it might seem fair to criticize that fact, I should admit, I don't know if my kid self would have understood all that without the game spelling it out to such a degree. The larger issue is when Nila inevitably betrays Arpeggio and takes Clockwork's power for herself and then gives herself a Ben 10 fusion name. Hell-bent on becoming as powerful as possible for no given reason. Nothing in Nila's backstory really connects the dots with a want to be all-powerful and take over the world, it just feels kinda last minute. But I still enjoy the climax of the story quite a bit as Sly and Carmelita team up to defeat Clockla as Sly drops the truth bomb right here. You might have a new body, Nila, but you're still the low-down, backstabbing coward we've beaten time and time again. This won't be any different. Be brave while you can! Now, as for the ending, it's one where I have a hard time even thinking of a way to describe the way it makes me feel, but I'll try my best. It always feels a bit sad as this final gameplay segment where you have to enter the head of Clockwork as Bentley, knowing what'll happen next. Let's get out of here! She's about to explode! Ah! My glasses! Huh? Bentley! I'll save you! <laughs> That's the last bit of gameplay in the game. Bentley loses his ability to walk after being crushed by Clockwork's beak, and in the ending, you see that the parts are still not destroyed. Like Sly says, Despite the explosion, they remain pristine. It was as if nothing could ever hurt them. This ending is one where I might be able to recite it word for word if asked. I know I used to be able to do it when I was younger because it hit so hard. Everything I've mentioned thus far in the video is all coming together in this ending. Do you want intelligent writing? How about when Carmelita destroys the hate chip and that causes all of Clockwork's parts to disintegrate? Sly eloquently said, How ironic that Carmelita, a police officer, would be the one to lift the curse from the Cooper family. The menace of Clockwork would never again rise to threaten me or my children. In the first Sly game, he did everything for the sake of his family's history and reclaiming his birthright. Now, we see he did all this to protect the future of the family from this monster, and it's over. But at what cost to the present? I mentioned the expectations you'd have for children's media a couple times before in this video, and it goes doubly so for the ending. Will Sly now drop a smoke bomb and the gang gets away? No. Sly can read the room and is willing to make a sacrifice. True to her nature, she informed us that we were all under arrest. But one look at my gang told me that we were in no shape for a fast getaway. So, I offered to go peacefully in exchange for letting my friends walk. Even acknowledging how much his friends had gone through to get Sly to this point. They'd taken some bruises through all of this, but I was surprised, shocked really, to see them leave their gear behind as they walked away. Their wounds were deeper than I'd imagined. Those guys were hurting. It's all just made the characters feel more real than what I was used to. But it's not all sad news for said characters, though. Carmelita, capturing Sly, gets her job back and her name cleared. She and Sly even managing to bond a little bit over everything that's happened, leading to the final moments where Sly does manage to escape, ending with the player feeling satisfied in that, yes, the Cooper gang is in a dire strait going forward, although the ending goes to show that they're still friends at the very least, since they rigged the helicopter to allow Sly to escape. But my point is, there's a lot of intrigue in what's going to happen now. Nonetheless, the day is saved and we will see Sly again. Which is why, despite all the sad parts of the ending, I come away from this game with a smile on my face, looking forward to the finale of the series in the next game. Floating away on the night breeze, I could faintly make out Carmelita's voice. I'll find you, Cooper! I'll be seeing you soon, Green Tail. Now, why did I just explain so many of the things that make this story good? Did it require such an explanation of basic elements? Because yes, I am aware that foreshadowing, character arcs, and plot twists are not these supremely uncommon and surprising things to see in a story. 
I'm treating the story and its inner workings, and the fact that it has inner workings, like it's the hottest shit in town because it's the only way I can explain why Slide 2 is a game I'll always fondly remember to the day I die. It's because Slide 2 is an impactful game. It's not only a memorable story with these great characters, but for me, it's the fact that this was the game that introduced me to these storytelling devices that makes it a game I'll always remember and look back to whenever I'm asked what my favorite game is. I don't think Slide 2 is as replayable as Mega Man X or Resident Evil 2 Remake. I don't think the mechanics have nearly the versatility of games like Devil May Cry 5 or Metal Gear Solid 3. Slide 2's story is pretty simple in comparison to the raw emotions I get from every playthrough of The Last of Us, nor does it have the intricacy of a real great Ace Attorney case. There exist better open world games than Slide 2, better stealth games than Slide 2, better platformers, and even more interesting storylines. But that's the thing, Slide 2 will always rank high in my favorite games list because of that impact. As I said at the top of the hour, Slide 2 is a game that taught me that video games could be something more than just playing to get a high score, or for the intrinsic appeal of jumping around as your favorite licensed superhero. I had never seen a journey be this complex or emotionally resonant in anything I had ever seen before. It raised the bar for what my expectations from games were and made me a proper video game enthusiast. You can call it being nostalgia blind or whatever the heck you want. It doesn't matter to me, and this will always be one of my favorite gaming experiences to ever exist because of the talent and passion on display from the people who made it, trying to do something really special, and that's why Slide 2 is one of my favorite games of all time. And at that point, do I really need to say much more? Today, playing Slide 2 doesn't really get that much of a reaction out of me because I've played it so many times that I pretty much sucked all the juice out of that lemon, but in spite of that fact, I won't ever forget Slide 2 or the Slide Trilogy simply because of that impact I've been discussing. When comparing the Sly Cooper trilogy, the one I quickly point to without a second thought in regards to which one is my least favorite is Sly 3 Honor Among Thieves, which first released in the PlayStation 2 on September 26th of 2005. I have had an interesting history with this game, going from playing it often as a kid, replaying it when they did the HD collection in 2010, realizing it was my least favorite, hating it, gaining more respect for it for obvious reasons, and ending with, I love Sly 3, but it's my least favorite. The worst of the best, the Return of the Jedi effect, if that makes it clear what I'm talking about. It's got some fantastic elements and wraps the series up, but also stumbles in ways I didn't think Sly 1 or 2 did. However, for a large portion of Sly Cooper fans, Sly 3 is the favorite. Picking which of the four Sly games is a person's favorite is almost always a battle between Sly 2 and Sly 3, with it often being a battle between Sly 1 and Sly 4 for which one takes last place. As I've mellowed out as a person, I can't say I really care to see one game win out over another. Today, I'm not here to tell you why Sly 3 is the worst game in the trilogy with an hour and 11 minutes worth of examples. I have no such agenda. Now, I will still mention some things I didn't like in Sly 3, as I still would pick it as my least favorite of the three, but instead, I just want to do what I do in all my recent videos. Just focus on my experience with the subject, the stories I have with it, and what I like and don't like, and how the stories of its creation impact my experience. Those tend to be the biggest factors of my best videos, I find. To explore what makes Sly 3 so great, I see no better way to begin than its creation, which was done in a unique fashion compared to Sly 1 and Sly 2. Sly 3 had what was at the time, and probably still is, the fastest development cycle of any game produced by Sucker Punch. Sly 1 was in development for three years, and Sly 2 was done in two years. With this game being released just one year after Sly 2, that means they only got about 10 or 11 months to build an entire 10-hour game before it had to ship. This also being a smaller development team than a lot of AAA studios at the time. So it sounds like a daunting task, and I suppose it is, but they had their reasons. The PS3 was due to launch in 2006, so I'd imagine they wouldn't want to work on a PS2 game for that year, nor launch Sly 3 on PS3 when the whole series was so at home on PS2. That's merely speculation on my end, though. What we do know is that Sly 3 was more of a fun challenge for the team. How much can we accomplish in under a year? A challenge to look back on fondly to this day. When diving into the game, I can see why they had that confidence in their ability to pull it off, because Sly 3 shows that Sucker Punch were masters of their Sly craft at this point. The animated cutscenes are the best in the series, with more movement in the characters than ever before, while still maintaining the feel of a graphic novel. The characters are consistently on model, unlike a few bits of Sly 2 where the poses might look a little weird and the proportions might get screwy. Sly has six fingers here, I challenge you to unsee that. None of those issues are present in Sly 3 as the production value has been raised across the board. The visuals popping much more in Sly 3 as the characters all appear more vibrant and saturated. The developers worked hard on the particle effects to give the combat, for example, a cartoony feel. Just compare Sly's cane swipe in Sly 1 and Sly 2 to Sly 3 and you'll see what I mean. Several areas will come with day and night settings with different skyboxes and lighting conditions throughout the streets. 
The in-engine cutscenes haven't seen much of a boost from Slide 2, still just relying on poses they reuse over and over again alongside gameplay animations, which will look really stiff when you see Sly walking, for example. But I still think that from a production standpoint, Sly 3 shows that Sucker Punch is getting the most out of the PS2 that they could, taking everything they had learned thus far into account to really up their game visually. Their mastery of pacing and intrigue is evident throughout the prologue as Sly and Bentley alongside five mystery characters are raiding Kane Island, the home of the fabled Cooper Vault. The location that Sly's ancestors had placed their vast storage of wealth and treasure. Sly obviously looking to collect. I had played Sly 1 and 2 before this, so you go in expecting this big job that's going to end with a chase with Carmelita and a getaway, but this game maximizes the suspense in that the setting is totally different from anything we've seen before. The Cooper gang suddenly has a bunch of new members, and all this is happening while the player's main question starting the game would just be what happened to the Cooper gang after Sly 2? Evidently a lot. The vault is about to open as you get introduced to the new main villain, Dr. M, who owns the deed to the island and has been trying to get inside the vault for years, but only a Cooper cane can do it. The prologue ends on the note of Sly about to be eaten alive by Dr. M's monsters, but then get the context. Sly 3 is one of those, yeah, that's me, you might be wondering how I got into this position kind of stories. It's explained that following Sly 2, Bentley was permanently paralyzed from the waist down, and Murray feels guilty for what happened and quit the team entirely, while Sly comes to learn of the Cooper Vault from a member of his father's gang who's currently doing time. Bentley learning to overcome his limitations by building the most super-powered wheelchair you've ever seen, complete with rocket boosters and bombs. It's pretty cool. Sly and Bentley realize that they alone don't have what it takes to overcome Dr. M and his massive operation on Kane Island, so they knew they needed to grow their ranks if they wanted to make a play for the Cooper Vault, setting up Sly 3. Getting inside the place would take precision, creativity, and moreover, it would take an army of world-class thieves. Finding and bringing together that much talent won't be easy, but to get inside the Cooper Vault and collect my inheritance, I was willing to pay the price. Which brings us right into the gameplay as the first objective in the story is for Sly and Bentley to track down Murray and bring him back into the team. Sly 3 follows the same gameplay model as Sly 2. Each episode takes place in a different location as Sly, Bentley, and Murray do different missions to set up a grand heist at the end of the level, requiring all their combined skills to get a task accomplished. At the start of the game, I'd say Sly pretty much plays exactly like he did in Sly 2, only a couple of tiny changes like Sly's uppercut being restricted to stealth segments and made an unlockable for regular combat. That kind of thing, you know, very minute and tiny details. But overall, Sly is very consistent with how he was in Sly 2. The biggest improvement between games was how Bentley and Murray handle. Bentley, as I said, operates in his super-powered wheelchair, something they knew was going to happen at the end of Sly 2 pretty early on. Maybe somebody in the audience can confirm this for me, but I'm imagining it'd be really cool for a kid in a wheelchair to play this game and get to be a badass character who was also in one as well. A character who was now, I'd argue, more badass in the chair than he was in Sly 2. I wasn't kidding, Bentley has fully tricked the thing out, first getting these rocket boosters upon double jumping that can be upgraded into a quadruple jump with a hover. He drops bombs much faster and he can now pickpocket guards by using his coin magnet. Because of Bentley's new hovering capabilities that are offered from the start of Sly 3, getting around as him is much easier than it was in Sly 2, so the issue of Sly being the only character that's fun to navigate areas as is removed entirely since upper paths and shortcuts are easily reached as Bentley and he can pickpocket guards too, just in his own way while retaining all the things he could do in the last game like putting enemies to sleep with his sleep darts and dropping bombs from a distance. He's a real powerhouse in this one, but still doesn't take that honor away from Murray, who has also received quite an upgrade in this game. Getting around as him was the worst of the three in Sly 2, and they've improved that wholesale in Sly 3. Arguably, he's the most fun character to traverse the areas as. In Sly 3, Murray is a student of the Dreamtime Arts, which gives him the ability to roll into a ball and launch into the air upon hitting the ground. And if you press X right as you land, you'll go even higher into the sky, this going on for as long as you keep pressing the button. Getting to see the levels from this high up and also having this timed button press be correlated to how high you go in the air makes the basic act of running around as Murray really satisfying, as I can't think of anywhere he can't launch up to. He can also pickpocket guards as well, just by picking them up and shaking their loose coins out of their pockets. The only trade-off being that stronger enemies take more hits to defeat in this one, unlike Sly 2 where Murray just obliterated everything in two hits, which I will gladly take for these upgrades and how he functions. For the most part, I think Sly 3's hubs are smaller than the ones in Sly 2, but they feel bigger to me because they're divided up into different sections. Sly 2 maps, as I said, revolved around singular focal points like the peacock sign in Episode 1 or the prison in Episode 4. In Sly 3, if you look at the map of Episode 1, for example, the left side of the map is where the giant police station dome is located, right next to the giant Octavio sign. But on the other side of the map, you have the Rialto Bridge and Octavio's Opera House. Episode 3 having one fourth of the map be the hotel area, another fourth for the fields, the airplane garages next to that, and finally the Black Baron's castle in another corner. 
making it extremely difficult to get lost since each part of the hub world stands out visually from the other spots. That comes in handy too because Sly 3's maps lack the exploration you could get from Sly 2's. This game removed clue bottles and safes from the maps, as well as treasures you could collect in exchange. Clue bottles I can take or leave, but the treasure was a big loss in my eyes. I say that because buying upgrades is still a major part of Sly 3. In the last game, I bought upgrades I thought were the most useful, but that just means that a lot of them, like Bentley's Health Extractor or Sly's Stealth Slide, are just not going to be purchased. Sly 3 still has a lot of those, but they made pretty much all the upgrades fun to use. The added visual flair helps, like Bentley's Rocket Boost on the ground or Sly's Rocket Shoes and the Shadow Powers, but also, Sly can upgrade his cane attacks to charge up to a third level to unleash devastating spin attacks, charge attacks, and jump attacks that just destroy enemies and bosses. However, the player's only way of getting coins in Sly 3 for almost the entire game is by pickpocket grinding, which only yields about 100 coins at a time, so you have to choose wisely what upgrades you want to buy when you'd want almost all of them. Combine that with how you also have required upgrades like the grapple cam sprung on you, you just don't feel like you should buy a lot of upgrades for fun since you don't usually have that many coins in this game. But luckily, the best upgrades that expand your mobility are unlocked from the start, so you don't have to worry about those. Murray's new abilities make it so there are more missions the developers can use him in, beyond the beat em up and escort missions they'd repeat in Sly 2. Now, he's got missions akin to those in Sly 3, but might also need to use his bounce move to take out tar drums from high above, or use it to sneak by lasers he'd get hit by if he stood up. Variety is something Sly 3 wears on its sleeve, and in both this playthrough and my last playthrough in 2021, I've realized that this was a major win for Sly 3 over Sly 2, when I used to see it as Sly 3's biggest con. Your mileage may vary on this, but for a lot of players, Sly 2 starts feeling monotonous by the end as each episode reuses a lot of the same missions over and over, like pickpocketing as Sly or beating up enemies as Murray. In Sly 3, the tasks of the gang members themselves are given more variety, as Sly in three of the episodes has to make use of disguises to navigate around areas. So a few missions will be dedicated to that. Other missions might use his photography skills outside of the need for basic recon like Sly 2. Bentley gets new gimmicks like his talent for art decryption locking and the grapple cam that he uses to survey areas and lure guards with. All these new mission types feel at home in the structure set up by Sly 2. It just makes it so that you don't do the same thing too often though. I mean, Sly 2 had like 18 hacking minigames that often reused the same map with more enemies again and again. But in Sly 3, you only do it like six times and each map is distinct. The levels themselves also come with more platforming like the sewers bit as Sly in Episode 3 or the cave exploration missions as Sly and Murray in Episode 2. As if that wasn't good enough, the Cooper gang expands its roster by four members by the end of the game. The new characters are side portions compared to the main trio, but what I like is that they provide their own twist on Sly gameplay that the game continues to build and challenge throughout. The Guru begins by riding on the backs of guards to bash obstacles in Episode 2, which grows into chasing down targets in Episode 3, and ends with hopping from shark to shark in the middle of the ocean in Episode 6. Penelope gets all the RC missions relegated to her as the difficulty curve grows in a similar manner to the Guru, this mission with carefully avoiding lasers of the RC car in Episode 4 being one of my favorites. I also love Dimitri's segments as he has one swimming mission that's quiet and atmospheric, but tense due to all the sharks surrounding you but then another swimming mission that's a real test of your reaction time as you quickly dodge obstacles. Carmelita also gets into the mix as a playable character in dedicated shooting levels, but even that doesn't cover how much variety is in Sly 3. There are speedboat chases, biplane duels, and an entire pirate ship game of traveling the ocean and raiding other pirate ships for treasure in Episode 5. It's an entirely fleshed out sub-game with ranks depending on your total wrecked ship count, strategy in that opposing ships are weakest in the front and the back, decision making in that sinking a ship will net you less coins than raiding it when it's about to go under, all just sitting inside of a full level with platforming and other minigames. This being the best way to get coins in Sly 3 for those who were curious. Sly 1 was criticized most for being too short, and so Sly 2 was much longer. That game was critiqued for lacking in replay value, so Sly 3 is bursting at the seams with content while also being as long as Sly 2 in its campaign, if not longer. Then, giving you a bunch of things to do in the post-game like replaying missions, doing ranked challenges, replaying missions with these red and blue 2000 3D goggles, and playing the game's multiplayer. If you wanted to, Sly 3 is a game that could last you a while, and that would come from more than just replaying the campaign like Sly 2. Of course, Sly 3 doesn't have a perfect roster of missions. Whenever replaying this game, I always groan when I get to this crane game in Episode 2, or the sewers in Episode 3, or the Cooper Hangar Defense, also in Episode 3. The non-tent minigames in Sly 3 are easily the worst parts of the entire thing. Segments of brainlessly mashing buttons to get through easy segments that go on a really long time. Moments like these are the ones that stick out the most when I think back on why Sly 3 is my least favorite in the trilogy, because Sly 1 and 2, even in its most minigame of minigame segments, never felt this dull. The Panda King being an entire playable character who meets the criteria to be labeled non-tent, as you just point at enemies and hold down the aim and fire button for what feels like 10 minutes. 
At least his second mission feels a little more active as you have to make sure the ship doesn't sink, but the first mission was as dull as it gets. Although, in the grand scheme of things, I think Sly 3's minigames were an absolute win, since I can only think of three truly bad examples in a sea of fun variety that prevents the game from ever coming close to being stale. Sly 3 really went all out in terms of set pieces and ideas. Sly 2 reused countries and guards between episodes as each one was only about an hour long, so they wanted to get as much out of the villains and story as possible. But Sly 3 made each level last for 90 minutes to 2 hours, packing them full of unforgettable set pieces like raiding Octavio's house from the basement all the way to the computer room, or the Cooper gang taking over the lemonade bar from the miners or the aforementioned biplane duels. Taking every last drop of inspiration they had and pouring it into the game. An entire level based on pirate ships, a boss fight where you fly above bamboo, the game has it all. That makes it very easy for me to see why Sly 3 is the favorite for so many people. It has so much diverse content as a really epic feeling game with constant action. Like I said, I no longer have an agenda to tear this game down, I think it's awesome. I just happen to prefer Sly 1 and 2. Like, Sly 1 is the 9.5, Sly 2 is the perfect 10, and Sly 3 is the 9.0. I've got nothing against this one besides the small issues, but I think it's still goaded overall. Which just leaves the story in writing. I'll say up front, Sly 3 is the story that as far as structure is concerned is my least favorite of the three. I mean to say that Sly 2's narrative just sucked me into the world of the game when I was a kid. There were twists and turns around every corner that even the critics at the time thought was really well handled. The overarching narrative that unfolded from one episode to the next is peak Sly Cooper structure, if you ask me. Even in Sly 1, which is far simpler as a story than Sly 2, was all about Sly's personal mission to reclaim his birthright from five fiendish felons. The basic arc and level-to-level -level structure also keeps me invested. Sly 3 is one that, looking at it from a surface-level perspective, seems the most disconnected. The closest you get into an overarching story is that you release Dimitri from jail in Episode 1 and then make a deal with him in Episode 3 that you'll help him later, which happens in Episode 5 as he joins the team as a diver at the end. Overall, each episode of Sly 3 is pretty self-contained, following a basic pattern. The Cooper gang will see an opportunity to grow their ranks, but in order to do that, they need to complete a task on behalf of the person who will join, or in Murray's case, rejoin the team. So there's no big villain team up in Sly 3 or episode cliffhangers that will leave you begging to play more. To the point where you might actually lose sight of the goal the game is building up to, which is using this larger team to open the Cooper vault, since everything that actually happens within the levels has nothing to do with that. Each level just opens up with this person's skills will help us with the Cooper vault job, and here's what they want, so we have to go do it. A largely episodic structure is, like I was saying, not how I'd structure a Sly game if I were in the writer's room, but I'm also not a screenwriter, so I wouldn't be in the writer's room anyway. So while it's not the idea I'd come up with, I'd say it was worth a shot after the plots of the previous games, and I'd also say it worked quite well. Because now, the game has to stand up on the legs of its character writing alone, and it's here that Sly 3 really shines. For starters, I think Sly 3 is easily the funniest game in this series. They know these characters and what people like about them, so you just get them bouncing off each other's energy and the result is really entertaining. Alright boys, look tough and get angry. It's time to intimidate the locals. I'm not sure I can do it! How do you guys get angry? Find the match deep inside yourself. Light it! And let the fire burn up your guts and boil your blood! Uh, yeah, I pretty much do the same thing. And you just have characters tossing out good one-liners whenever they get the chance. And I don't just mean the main characters, just the way the villains speak so dramatically in highs and lows gets a chuckle out of me. And that includes NPCs too. Bentley steals the show when it comes to the funniest moments in the game. No better example than his confrontation with Mugshot in the hotel in episode 3. You know, I've been thinking about your appearance. Look, if you don't got nothing to say nice, then don't say nothing at all. Get it? What? Ain't got no sassy comments, smart guy? Oh, I get it. You got nothing nice to say, so you're keeping quiet. That's real cute. You really got nothing nice to say? That's cold. Your mother was a broken down tub of junk with more gentleman callers than the operator. While Sly 3 provides players with a decent supply of laughs, the thing that ties everything in Sly 3 together is its themes, because I think Sly 3 is the most thematically rich game in the Sly Cooper series. This is something I spent some time going over in my last look at this game five and a half years ago. The fact that Sly 3 is all about accepting change and letting go of the past and growing as a result of it. This is a theme in every stage of the game, so let's start from the beginning. The Cooper gang was pretty devastated by what happened in their mission to destroy Clockwork in Sly 2, so they begin the game fractured. In Episode 1, Murray has fully committed himself to the Dreamtime arts under his mystic teacher because he couldn't live with himself having been unable to save Bentley from losing his legs in the last game. 
Murray does himself no good by dwelling on this past tragedy, especially since Bentley says it to him straight. Get over it, Murray. I don't blame you and never have. The only thing I feel bad about is losing my pal. But he still has an obligation to his teacher now, one that's shattered in his confrontation with the level's main villain, Don Octavio. The local mob boss who used to be an opera singer who got cast out of fame because rock music became more popular than what he did. Now he's gonna force everyone to listen to him whether they want to or not. Goofy cartoon setup, obviously, but the parallel is clear. Octavio is a villain purely because of his inability to accept the passage of time and changing tastes, and despite the power he now wields, he's going to use it to enact vengeance upon the masses who dare do this to him. The inability to let go of that resentment is why he is the way he is, not because people dare change tastes with the passage of time. Murray gets a shining moment by defending Bentley from this scumbag after he kicks Bentley out of his wheelchair. That does it! I'll floss my teeth with your spine! The Murray returns! The inner peace Murray was seeking was this all along, moving past the traumas of before and just doing your best now, which is why he can rejoin the gang after all is said and done. Episode 2 is the least connected here since the goal is getting Murray's guru to join the gang, a character who only speaks gibberish that everyone miraculously understands, and the villains are tearing up his beautiful Australian landscape, so you have to help him stop them. Guess you could say the point is that change in the pursuit of selfish goals is bad, but that's about all I got. Otherwise, it's a pretty dry level in terms of story and gameplay, but then in Episode 3, you have the RC specialist Penelope who will only join the gang if they beat her boss, the Black Baron, in a dogfight. But the truth is that Penelope is the Black Baron. She created the character to get past the Aces competition's age restrictions, and then it took off and became an icon, so she felt she needed to keep up appearances more and more as the years went on. The Cooper gang freeing her from this toxic influence in her life. The level you meet her in shows how she's fiercely loyal, and now that's going to the Cooper gang. Although, you have some tension seeing as she and Bentley basically catfished each other to get to this point. Episode 4 being where the themes hit the hardest because it creates a difficult situation for Sly himself. Bentley decides the only demolition expert they should seek out is the Panda King from Sly 1, but he's now a shell of a man following his defeat at the hands of Sly years ago. Sly has to grapple with the fact that this guy was on the team that killed his parents, and the Panda King equally wants nothing to do with Sly because Sly destroyed his empire. Now, obviously the story isn't saying feel bad for the Panda King because Sly stopped him from murdering people en masse. It's merely a larger plot about resentment and trauma yet again, as the Panda King's daughter was abducted by a warlord named General Sao who wants to marry her to unite the lineages of Sao and King. The writer has pulled this character back from Sly 1 to tell that story. The Panda King was always a spiteful person, that's his backstory after all, but his whole arc is coming to terms with what he's done to save his daughter and recognizing how much Sly has lost because of him and his cohorts and how Sly is able to put aside their differences, so why shouldn't he? They still aren't friends, their scenes together are intentionally awkward, but it's all in the larger story of growth and change. The conflict between the two is perfectly shown at the start of Episode 4 as the Guru manages to bridge the minds between Sly and the Panda King, King just endlessly replaying the fight he had with Sly years ago. Sly aptly saying, We both know why you're here. You're fixated on the moment of your greatest defeat. I beat you, and forever after you've wondered how it all fell apart. I hate you, Sly Cooper. You've ruined me. Ruined the Panda King. And I've hated you, but that doesn't make any of this real. Years have passed, and, and we've both changed. Come out of this trance. Let's meet each other as we are today, and, and let go of who we were when this fight occurred. You are correct. Forgive me. My mind is not always my own. Leading to Sao as a character. He's just the worst of the worst, a total scumbag and someone forcing Jin King to marry him, uttering this line to really drive it home how he's got no decency whatsoever. But she doesn't want to marry you. She's a woman. She doesn't know up from down. Once I convinced her father to take up meditation, she was ripe for the picking. I faced a lot of bad men in my time, but you, sir, are the worst. He's also obsessed with status and lineage, him thinking Sly is a good adversary because of his own family history. But again, Sly says it succinctly. It's not about the family name, pal. It's what you do with it. By this point in the game, its themes are pretty clear. The heroes and villains are all defined by an opportunity for change. The heroes always take it and grow from it, and the villains don't, falling deeper into cycles of tradition and resentment. Which naturally leads to a discussion on our three main characters and the final boss of Sly 3, Dr. M. Bentley's whole arc in Sly 3 concludes what his character has been about since Sly 1, coming out of his shell, which he did do in Sly 2, but was set back a bit because of what happened to him in that game. However, he comes back stronger than ever, leading the mission to rescue Penelope from Captain Lafouille in Episode 5. 
resolving the romantic tension between them that's been building since episode 3. Throughout all this, Sly's been pretty static, watching everyone around him change, doing so partially because of his positive influence. Which brings us right back to where we started. Getting crushed to death in the fist of some genetics experiment gone wrong. Not the way I thought I'd go out. Here I am at the end, and suddenly all I can think about is what a coward I've been towards Carmelita. Sly has had this game of cat and mouse with Carmelita go on for years at this point, and in his dying moments, all he can think about is how he should have just given up on this legacy of trouble and just be honest with himself and Carmelita, who turns up to save him from the monster attack. But really though, the Cooper legacy has, at this point, brought nothing but pain. Clockwork had that burning hatred for the Coopers that caused him to become immortal to attack them generation after generation, Sly fighting back and getting the Thievius Raccoonus restored. But then we see how much pain was brought upon the entire team trying to destroy Clockwork and Sly too, not just Sly himself. The Cooper legacy has brought this upon them, and now that Sly has restored the book and killed Clockwork for good, why are we still doing this? Sly fully realized that in what he thought were his final moments. A scene that I thought was pretty intense when I first played this game however many years ago. Fun fact, if you die as Carmelita in this boss fight, the game over screen is Sly getting eaten by the monster. That's an image I'm not going to forget. Once you actually get inside the Cooper vault, it's empty. Filled with enough wealth to last 10 lifetimes, but at what cost to each of these people as individuals? It's almost haunting in a way, rather than satisfying to see as the place is filled with nothing but death traps. The Cooper legacy is nothing but a cobweb-ridden den, one that's filled with more money than you could ever imagine, but is this a legacy worth leaving behind? Sly's father's portrait's even cut off, this level showing us that the man was so powerful that he'd mastered the ability to walk on lasers, but nobody will ever know because the Cooper legacy is one of misery and isolation. While Sly has great reverence for his lineage, he's starting to realize this fact as well. Backed by the music that plays here. <laughs> Dr. M, the villain, is the epitome of everything this game's villains are trying to say. It's revealed that he was the brains of Sly's father's gang, and he's been at Kane Island trying to bust into the Cooper vault for over a decade and has gone completely insane. Only because he hated Sly's father so much and felt entitled to the Cooper fortune. Even though you can imagine, he must have already had quite a lot to finance this operation in the first place. Once more, this endless resentment is central to the story. Bentley's final arc is a bit contentious in the fanbase, as many think Bentley started to question Sly at the last minute is out of nowhere. Do you ever feel like you're playing second fiddle to Sly? But I actually feel like the whole story was building up to it, as Penelope almost fell for Sly, causing Bentley to feel a little bit like all his efforts never get seen. So when Dr. M says this to Sly, Then why is it called the Cooper Gang, you self-centered egomaniac? It causes Bentley to think about it. But Murray snaps him out of it. Think of it this way, Bentley. If it were you in that vault and Sly and I were out here, what would he do? Stop these thugs and protect his friend. Right, and that's what I'm gonna do. This Cooper gang won't be like the last one and keep this never-ending miserable cycle going. These guys are brothers and are gonna fight like it. Leading to the final battle where Sly, who's all about growth and change, comes face to face with Dr. M, who is the antithesis. The game ends with Sly getting the chance to make things right with Carmelita, and he takes it, faking amnesia as a way to start over. But as Bentley says in the ending, Dr. M refused to leave the vault that was crumbling around him. He'd spent his life lusting over the Cooper fortune, and he wasn't going to give it up, no matter what the cost. Dying alone with nothing but his hatred at his side. Did him a lot of good, right? Sly 3 set out to give the series a satisfying payoff, as all three of our main characters finally decided to just move on with their lives. Bentley and Penelope using their genius for scientific pursuits, Murray going all in on his driving and mechanic skills, and Sly living life with Carmelita. I spent all this energy on how Sly 3 is a story about making positive change because it truly is the core DNA of the plot. Everything the game was about in both its serious characters and its comedic ones is building up to this ending. If everything I just laid out was actually a massive coincidence, I'd be stunned. Because Sucker Punch knew this was their last Sly Cooper game. They wanted to wrap up the trilogy in a satisfying way before exploring other franchises. I think the ending is about the characters as much as it is about the studio who made them. I said the story of Sly was linked to the people who made it in the Sly 1 video, and that fact has come to the forefront now. Bentley makes sure to mention in the ending that he holds his time with Sly and Murray dear to his heart, but there's strength in moving forward. Which was the attitude of the studio at the time. While it's fun to live and, uh, and stay with your uh, family, you know, it's useful to move, and it's useful to go somewhere new and have new experiences, and I think that was... Uh, something that we were pretty clear on, that we knew we were going to do Sly 3, and then we were going to go do uh, new IP. 
It was great fun working on Sly and growing so much as a team and getting all the letters from the young fans who played Sly, but when you've said it all there is to say, it's good to branch out and try new things. This being a lesson that unfortunately fell on deaf ears for the audience of the game. I mean, it's a story about letting go of and accepting the past and moving forward in a game made for like 8 year olds, we were not going to get it at the time. But of course, Sucker Punch wasn't trying to end Sly forever with this game, they just wanted to end their time with the series on a satisfying high note. But they left the door open in the hopes another developer would take the reins and keep growing the Sly IP. Literally! Cause I'm building a time machine to find out! This time travel sequel hook being the thing that most of the community became obsessed with, rather than just enjoying the ride it took to get to this point. I don't have to tell any longtime viewers that I've had quite the history with Sly Cooper Thieves in Time, which was released on the PlayStation 3 in 2013. For right now, I'm not going to use this opportunity to disparage that game, as at the time, I and many fans were over the moon for more Sly content. And as of today, I don't think Sly 4 is some terrible game. It's alright, it's good fun at its best. Terribly written at worst. But the reason I bring it up is that as the years have gone on since that game was released with its cliffhanger ending, I just look back and see the ending of Sly 3 for what it is. The ending of these characters. Sly 3 was all about moving on, trying to achieve more out of life. That's what I see in Sly 3. It makes sense that the young audience didn't get what it was going for back in 2005, and it was nice to see the crew again in Sly 4 as sort of a reunion show. And I would love to see Sly one last time in a remade trilogy like Crash and Spyro got a few years back. However, I think we, as in all the members of the Sly community, should just accept that Sly 3 ended the way it did and that was on a good note. I'm not saying to hate Sly 4, don't twist my words. I mean that in the years since the ending of Sly 4, fans have desperately clawed in every imaginable way in the hopes of getting a Sly 5. When I think that desperation just shows that a deeper understanding of Sly 3 was never reached. If Sly 5 or a remake, reboot, or whatever happens, I'm there day one. But if not, I'm also content just enjoying the content we had instead of endlessly begging for more of it, holding on to this resentment of newer, more popular games like Don Octavio himself. I think more people are coming around to this idea with each passing year, seeing as it's now been longer between Sly 4 and the present day than it was going from Sly 3 to Sly 4. When Sly 4 came out, Sly 3 was only 8 years old, and now Sly 4 is older than that and the gap is only going to keep going up. But speaking of Sly 3, I guess we shouldn't waste any more time and begin talking about Sly 4. To do that, we need to go back in time. On September 26th of 2005, Sucker Punch released Sly 3 Honor Among Thieves for the PlayStation 2, a game that, it turned out, was the final game in the series developed by Sucker Punch, the studio who created the series from scratch back in 2002, growing its scale and scope throughout the trilogy. Sly 3 was a game about change, and this was evident throughout the campaign, but was then made final in the game's climax as the ending saw the main trio, Sly, Bentley, and Murray, definitively give up the life of thieving for good in exchange for something even bigger. I don't know for sure, but I believe this story was meant to echo the spirit of Sucker Punch who knew going into Sly 3 that this was their final one, not because they were tired of Sly or didn't like Sly, but because they thought with the arrival of the PlayStation 3 it would be useful to them as a studio to start something new to continue growing their talent as developers in the 3D action space, instead of remaining in the same boat forever. This is how we got Infamous, which first released on the PS3 in 2009. However, Sucker Punch didn't close the book on Sly. They wrapped up their story, but decided to leave the back door open so another developer could hopefully continue the series, since again, they didn't set out to end Sly, they set out to complete their run with the series. But it seemed like, for a while, Sly 3 was the end. Until 2010. Sanzaru Games released the Sly Cooper HD Collection for the PlayStation 3, a remaster of the Sly Cooper Trilogy in HD and widescreen. The Sly Collection is another thing unfairly maligned by me in the past, but again, that's not important right now. It's definitely the most accessible and easy way to play the trilogy, if you're interested in it. Provided you still have a PS3, of course. Some minor issues crop up as a result of the conversion, and some really bizarre ones happen as well, but still. The Sly Collection came with this bonus cutscene that teased Sly 4? Which ignited the fanbase as the collection was the first release in this series in 5 years. Seems pretty small in comparison to the current day, doesn't it? I can speak on the HD Collection bringing the hype back because while I never stopped loving Sly, it was the time between beating Sly 3 and the games getting remastered where I, and probably a lot of other fans, just spent their time on other things that were coming out. In my case, the never-ending stockpile of Sonic games in the late 2000s was something to occupy your time with while it seemed Sly's story was done. But then we got to E3 2011, and one of the bigger reveals at Sony's press conference. There's one Worldwide Studios title that I personally get hundreds of emails from consumers about each year, asking, when are we bringing this franchise back to PlayStation? 
It's a character and franchise that has sold more than four million units since we first introduced it in 2002. This is a great family-friendly franchise that even hardcore gamers couldn't put down. Let's take a quick look. Sly Cooper Thieves in Time, the long-awaited sequel to Sly 3, was going to be released in 2012 and was being developed by Sanzaru Games. They had begun development on Sly 4 before the HD collection, pitching their idea for a Sly sequel to Sony in the late 2000s as a handheld game, but Sony commissioned the team to do an HD trilogy and that's how the gears started turning for the full PS3 sequel. The original pitch presentation from Sanzaru Games to Sony was suddenly something we could imagine before recently as Sanzaru talked about pitching Sly 4 to Sony and that leading to the HD collection during the interviews for Sly 4, but as I said, recently the entire presentation has become publicly available. It was sold on eBay and is now a treasured part of the Sly community. You can see the game running on the prototype of the PlayStation Vita, its would-be online features, sales projections, budget projections, series, sales trends, and the list goes on. It's pretty interesting. If you're a fan of the series and want some insight into how games get greenlit, this is an interesting showcase. This history and context is necessary as, with this game being 10 years old, I want to look at its history and my history with it from all sides, past, present, and future. So where was I? E3 2011. I was over the moon at the reveal of this game. Only thing was, the trailer didn't have any gameplay, but the show floor did, so we got plenty of interviews from GameSpot, IGN, and all the others. I soaked that stuff up like a sponge. I genuinely think I watched every single interview pertaining to Sly Cooper Thieves in Time imaginable throughout its almost two-year-long pre-release. Thanks to that, I can tell you the media coverage in this game was much more sporadic compared to bigger games coming out, like you'd see the game at PAX 2011 in August and then not see it again until March 2012. I suppose this is pretty normal for games in hindsight, however, if you're a kid with few better things to do than spend all day thinking about how good this game was going to be, then that time with no news was pretty agonizing. Especially when the game got delayed in August of 2012 from its generic holiday 2012 release date to February of 2013. Something done to avoid such a niche game having to compete with the holiday 2012 roster of games. While waiting for this game, what I spent quite a lot of time doing was replaying the Sly trilogy again and again to make sure I was ready for the new one. Something I thought would enhance my experience with Sly 4, but in hindsight probably didn't help now that I was one of those fans who knew the games inside and out. But hey, Sly 4 was the most hyped I had ever been for a game at the time, which is saying a lot considering what else was coming out at the time, but this was how I expressed that excitement. After all that build up, the interviews, the trailers, the announcement of the Vita port, the animated short, the character trailers, ah! what was that? Shrimp cocktail! the gradual showcase of the levels, bosses, and Cooper ancestors, the delay, the replaying of the old games, the school days spent thinking about how this game was going to turn out, it finally released on February 5th, 2013. It was certainly a life-changing experience, just not the one I thought it would be. The first playthrough of Thieves in Time was so bizarre. I'm trying to recall memories from 10 years ago now, but what I recall was that I spoiled the plot rotten on YouTube, and then I got to play the game where I instantly fell in love with it. I said on day one that the first level showed the game was a contender for the best in the series, but by the time I finished it, I remember thinking, it was good, but something about it didn't seem right. As the months rolled by and I did a second playthrough, I was thinking, no, this one is definitely the worst in the series, but it was okay, uh, right? By early 2014, I had made up my mind. This game is awful! The writing is such a downgrade, the story is trash, the gameplay is nowhere near as good as the trilogy, it makes Sly 3 look like Sly 2, Sanzaru has killed my childhood! This is the status quo I remained in for the next year or so, until I played it again in 2015 and thought, well, the game was better than I remembered, but the writing manages to be worse. Late 2015 is when I finally started doing YouTube videos, something Sly 4 Extra made me want to do because nobody on YouTube was really saying what I was feeling about the game. And that's when we finally got to the review in the summer of 2016 where I concluded that the game was better than I remembered, but the story was even worse. As the video included several explosive rants on said story, but felt like the game, barring some issues, was a decent gameplay experience. They focused on making this game play well, and if you are a Sly fan that just appreciates the parkour gameplay and not much else, Sly Cooper Thieves in Time is right up your alley. But that might not be how you remember it, because following that video in 2017, I decided to start making it my personality to hate the game, which became the dominant narrative, despite what the original review might have said. As stated before, this is something I'll talk in more detail about at the end of the video. What matters now is, a lot has changed with time. I'm 22 years old now, this game is 10 years old now, the game has received no sequel and in my opinion never will, 
for reasons we can discuss later. Besides merely turning into an adult, it's hard to be mad at this game because, well, it's been 10 years. Why continue to burn it to the ground, when all that's left is Ash anyway? Similar to Mega Man X6 last year, where I went back to a game I gave a scathing review and decided to not re-review it, but simply do a follow-up to the original where I would try to be nice to it, hence the title Learning to Love Mega Man X6. My intentions here are similar to that. Today, we're going back to Sly Cooper Thieves in Time to see, now that the dust is settled, what do I think of this game? Is it good, is it bad, or is it somewhere in between? This isn't going to be a comprehensive deep dive on its mechanics because I don't really feel like making that kind of video. I want to follow up on the original and cover what this game did well and how I feel about it as a package 10 years later. So let's start with those positives. Here's an obvious one. Sly 4 absolutely trounces in the original trilogy in terms of production value. This should be expected given the fact that the Sly trilogy were PS2 games, ones that didn't have the kind of resources that other studios like Insomniac Games and Naughty Dog did, and as a result, the Sly games had rather stiff in-game cutscenes that would recycle a lot of the same pre-baked animations multiple times. They made up for that with appealing character designs and quality art direction that made each environment pop, regardless of the limitations. However, Sly 4 being released towards the tail end of the PS3 era is leaps and bounds ahead of what the trilogy was capable of. Just looking at the animation, I think Thieves in Time is some of the best-looking cartoony animation I've seen in a game. Compared to Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, which released on PS5 in 2021, that game is definitely the best cartoon animation I've seen, but in a Pixar movie kind of way. In Sly 4, the movements of the characters and cutscenes is a joy to watch because it has that Saturday morning cartoon kind of vibe that the trilogy was trying to achieve, only fully brought to life. Each scene is packed full of motion, expressive facial animations, eyes being used to emphasize reactions, cartoony effects like Bentley's neck being extended when shocked or whatever. There are a lot of in-game cutscenes and Binocucom cutscenes in Thieves in Time, and the level of detailed animation in them is a sight to behold across the entire campaign. You clearly can't say this was a phoned-in effort, as Sanzaru's love of the Sly series shines through and how much effort they put into it from a production standpoint. Bringing back the composer from Sly 2 and 3, Peter McConnell, to do the score for Thieves in Time. I think on a sheer quality and variety standpoint, this might be his best work. The fact that Sly 4 sees the gang traveling to different points throughout history allowed McConnell to work with different styles of music meant to not only reflect different countries like prior games, but also different time periods, while also still having that distinct Sly Cooper sound. Remixing great tracks from prior Sly games like the Paris Rooftops from Sly 2, the Venice Espionage from Sly 3, and even something obscure like the Bentley Hacking minigame theme from Sly 1 gets remixed for the Alter Ego minigame, and that was from a different composer entirely. It's a great soundtrack with lots of upbeat energy, but also atmosphere when required. Although, I wish the late game tracks would have laid off the xylophone, but that's just a nitpick on my end. The only area I don't like this game from a production standpoint would be its animated cutscenes. If you were to think of an easy way to improve from the old games, it would be making them full motion, right? While each game added more motion to these scenes, the point was still that they were like graphic novels to bookend each level, and I think that is missing here. But then, I just generally don't care for the art style as the characters look really off-model and unappealing in many of the scenes. So I guess full motion wasn't the main issue, it's just that I don't care for the style that they went with. But to return to the things this game gets right, its visuals in the gameplay are definitely on the list. Sly 4 looks fantastic to this day. Its textures and environments look simple when you stop and observe them, but it fits in this cartoony world. Where the game shines is in its lighting and atmosphere. I'm always taken aback by the way the sun or moon shine in the sky and how the shadows look whenever I play this game. All this being bolstered by a target of 60 frames per second. Sly 4 does not have a perfect frame rate, but it stays in the 50s range enough to where I say this game is held up in terms of performance in a way that many 7th gen games have not. Ratchet and Clank A Crack in Time might have looked more realistic, but then has dated textures and resolution compared to what exists now and had considerable performance costs. Not to say Sly 4 isn't compromising on anything, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. I just think the game looks great. But then you might wonder, how does Sly 4 fare as a gameplay experience, going back to it after all these years? Well, the answer is that Sanzaru Games did quite a lot to expand the foundations of Sly gameplay and do a lot of interesting things with it. My only major gripe with playing Sly 4 is that I think the characters don't feel as good to play as they used to. The controls are the exact same as previous Sly games, interacting with things using the circle button, attacking on square, special attacks on triangle, sprinting on R1, and so on. The difference is that the characters are much heavier than they used to be. In Sly 2 and 3 in particular, Sly was pretty much weightless. You could turn on a dime, jump in any direction without effort, land from high rooftops and start moving immediately upon landing and the list goes on. In Sly 4, turning around may see you stop and you turn. Jumping feels a lot heavier, which messes with my muscle memory in platforming and landing has a large impact and you have to spend that extra second or two in recovery. These things must sound minor, and they are, however my muscle memory is messing with me when I play Thieves in Time because I'm just so used to the old games that I might miss jumps I'd easily make in Sly 2. However, 
If you never suffered the Sly Trilogy addiction, this probably won't be on your radar while playing. And speaking of radars, that brings me to the fact that the model of gameplay is exactly like Sly 2 and 3. There are five worlds in Thieves in Time where you play as Sly, Bentley, Murray, and Carmelita as you get introduced to a new Cooper ancestor in each stage who you also play as who brings his own special abilities to the gameplay. In each world, you do a preliminary mission as Sly as you get to grips with the hub world and then do more missions as the other characters to set up for the heist, which is the final mission of the level. The developers took advantage of the PS3's technical capabilities to generate much larger worlds than you got on PS2. The total surface area in Sly 4's hubs are usually larger than most areas of 2 and 3, however the areas come with more branching pathways and verticality too, in that there will be higher sections, lower sections, and platforming to get between them, rather than just having the usual rooftops and streets like the previous games did. To get around, you can use the holographic markers in the sky like the last two games, but you also get a full map with the press of select. But then in the bottom right, you get a mini-map that will lead you to important destinations like the map in, say, Jack 2. This is not something that was required in the previous game since the areas were small enough to make holographic markers enough of an indication on where to go. And this wasn't even something that was going to be in the game from the beginning. I remember that in an interview, Matt Kramer, lead designer of the game, said that playtesters thought a mini-map would be useful and then it ended up in the game. Really demonstrating that Sanzaru was open to feedback and willing to change things, something that was said in that very same interview. I don't feel like digging up receipts though, I'm pretty confident it was E3 2012, so just uh, take my word for it. How I feel regarding Sly Cooper gameplay has evolved quite a lot over the years. To the point where in my final review of Sly 3, I had said I was starting to see the appeal of the added variety because it helped break up the monotony of the core gameplay, an issue that Sly 2 suffered from, especially from my perspective. Where Sly 3 failed was how in half of that variety was a good way to shake up the pace, but the other half was completely boring, button-mashing content. But in principle, I liked the idea. Sly 4 has plenty of variety, just without the aimless one-off minigames that Sly 3 had. Here, each episode has roughly the same number of missions as Sly 2 and Sly 3, around 8 to 9 per world, but the game gets more mileage out of them by making them much longer and involve more platforming than just doing tasks. Instead of having more than one pickpocketing mission in one world, you'll have a mission where you need to pickpocket three things to create the samurai armor that you use to get into the prison, which is an entire level in and of itself. The game still gives us all the Sly mission tropes, but without having to use them again and again because it crafts longer missions out of them. The biggest win with Sly 4 was that Sanzaru put a lot more focus on the platforming than Sucker Punch did when doing Sly 2 and 3, like I said. There are a lot of missions in Thieves in Time where you'll be forced to use Sly's mechanics in ways the games don't really tend to, like having to time where you move on this neon pipe in accordance with the lasers. Sly 3 had a lot more platforming than Sly 2 to be sure, but I think Sly 4 consistently brings platforming to the front and center of the gameplay experience, and I think it was for the better. The game also cuts out the worthless upgrades, but keeps in essentials like the paraglider and adds new ones that are stellar, like different types of bombs for Bentley or shot types for Carmelita. Always loved using the bomb kick for Bentley, it's just way more satisfying than the trigger bomb ever was. But my favorite new upgrade is the rail sprint, an essential upgrade that allows Sly to do as the name suggests running on rails much faster. Point is, the game has a lot of diverse content while keeping things simple and organized. Sly 3 had a total of 8 playable characters, and that was because of the gang's expansion for the Cooper Vault job. Sly 4 keeps things more consistent in that the core cast is still Sly, Bentley, and Murray, but this time Carmelita is a member of the team, and you'll play as her in select segments. But then the extra gameplay comes from each level having a playable Sly ancestor, each with their own special attacks and unique gimmicks, like Ryoichi flying from point to point, Galath getting a shield to ram enemies with, Selim being able to fly up poles, and Bob Cooper climbing on ice walls. Best of all being Tennessee Kid Cooper, whose cane is also a gun. Here they have a pretty fun third-person shooting gameplay style, as the aiming feels really good and the crack shot technique is always satisfying to use. Carmelita also benefits from this improved shooting, as with both her and Tennessee, it's easy to hit targets, but not so mindless that it almost plays itself, like in Sly 3 with this ludicrously big reticle. When purely looking at the gameplay of Sly 4, it's hard to get bored of it because there's always something new to do. Like how Bentley gets three different hacking minigames, one that's an expanded version of the Sly 2 and 3 style with different cyber vehicles to control and use, another is this twin-stick shooter that feels like the kind of minigame you play in Sly 1, and then the entirely original 6-axis hacking game. Although I never liked this one, or any of the forced 6-axis controller minigames. It's really clunky to play and leads to deaths that don't feel like your fault, and also just feels several years out of date considering the most PS3 exclusives stopped using 6-axis in like 2008, and this game was released in the same year as the PlayStation 4. But as I was saying, the game comes with a lot of replay value, like how Sly gets new costumes in each world that gives him a special ability like the samurai armor deflecting fire, or the prison suit giving you a ball and chain to hit crates with. In past games, once you finished a world, there was almost no reason to come back to it. But Matt Kramer, lead designer, said that Metroid was his favorite game and wanted to inject some of that kind of item-based exploration into the world of Sly 4. 
By that, I mean you'll see buckets with arrows in them in episode one. However, you don't have any way to interact with them until episode four. And that gives you the idea to go back to previous worlds and see what you can find and get rewarded with treasures that allow you to buy more upgrades from the shop. It's taking things that have worked in previous games like the replayability of Sly 1 levels, the fun of treasure hunting in Sly 2, and mixing them together. This game is just filled with creative gameplay ideas and segments, like Tennessee and Carmelita teaming up to rescue the gang, with Carmelita shooting enemies from the boat and Tennessee climbing up and clearing the path, eliminating the enemies on the side. Or Sly using his time-slowing thief suit from Episode 5 to carefully navigate from one side of this rushing water to another. A pretty compelling Sly platforming segment, which is usually not how it goes in these games. When looking at these gameplay ideas alone, it's very easy to see that Sly 4 could be a contender for the best game in the series. If you enjoy Sly mostly for the gameplay, then these are fair reasons why you'd think this is the best game in the series, or deserving of the title. You know, consistent, streamlined game design, I totally get it. I think this game does a lot of good and brings many creative ideas to the Sly table. However, even looking at the game divorced from any critique beyond the act of playing the game, I can only ever conclude that this is my least favorite game in the series and there's one singular reason why. The abysmal loading screens. This is the one thing pretty much everyone agrees with on Thieves in Time. The loading is nightmarish. I seriously forgot it was this bad. For the video, I played the game on original PS3 hardware and the loading was legendarily bad. Here's how. Leaving the safe house, entering the safe house, or any area in the game that's not the hub world will begin a loading screen and these go on for, at minimum, 30 seconds. I timed it. The first time I left the hub world in episode 1 saw me waiting at this loading screen for 46 seconds. Almost an entire minute of staring at black nothing. The first loading screen in episode 5 took a minute and 12 seconds. It is ridiculous. Bad loading really can kill a game because it brings the pace down to a screeching halt. This being one of the worst cases of it I have ever seen. Now, Sly 4 isn't nearly as inefficient with its loading like Sonic 06 and its baffling town missions and all that, thus being more shocking to experience than Sly 4, but looking back at it, Thieves in Time has, pound for pound, some of the longest loading screens I've ever seen, and that's compared to the likes of Mega Man X7 or Sonic 06, some of the most poorly optimized games I have played. But then other PS3 games with more complex visuals also don't have this problem. I'm not sure why it loads for so long, like did Sony's wanting a Vita port for crossplay features create some kind of data management issue? I have no idea. But playing Thieves in Time tires me out by the end because of the loading. To hammer this home, my first session of footage was everything from the start of the game to the end of episode 1. That session was 2 hours and 1 minute. I decided to load this in the editor and remove all the loading screens and that reduced it to an hour and 48 minutes. 13 minutes of this session was loading. Almost 10%. Stretch that out across the entire game and you have a 10 and a half hour game where an entire hour of it is this. But thankfully, the story doesn't end there. That's right, gamers. I'm about to tell you that you can play Thieves in Time removed from the horrific loading screens. Well, not officially. I'm no stranger to emulation and thankfully my computer can handle RPCS3, the lead PS3 emulator. Naturally, one of the first games I played on it was Thieves in Time. This was how I have revisited this game in recent years, and this is also why going back to the game on console was so jarring, because believe it or not, the loading screens are far shorter when playing the game 10 years later on a PC emulator. Example, that 46 second load screen I mentioned a few moments ago lasted 13 seconds on PC. This is a night and day change. That is 70% shorter, making the entire game about an hour shorter, allowing you to just focus on the gameplay experience and thus have far more fun than you would playing it on the PS3. Like I said, I played this game on PC back in 2022 at some point and was surprised at how much more I enjoyed it than usual. But going back to the PS3 has revealed it all. It was the loading screens. They were that bad. But our PCS3 also comes with other benefits, like how you bump up the resolution with no cost to performance. Thieves in Time looked really good on PS3 at 720p, but playing it in 4K with no loading screens is like a completely different game. The visuals shine like never before and the game feels much better paced without all that dead air. Not to say this is a supremely accessible option for many people, but the option does exist for anyone curious about it. The reason I didn't do my playthrough for this video on the emulator was because I noticed that the frame rate was a little choppy for me, which is something I wasn't too bothered by when playing, since the original version didn't have a perfect frame rate anyway, but then it was also kind of choppy at certain intervals in the footage, which I thought would make for a poor viewing experience. I just need to upgrade my CPU. So in the meantime, I opted to play the game on the OG hardware and was then taken aback by how much of an effect the loading has on the game. As without it, I was truly able to appreciate things about this game I never did before, like how it brought so many great ideas to the table unfocused on platforming like I said a few moments ago. But that begins the problem, the massive asterisk that comes with my praising Sly 4's gameplay. I don't play Sly for gameplay. 
Well, definitely not because of the gameplay solely. This is something that tracks back to my first discovery of Sly Cooper on the shelves of Target back in 2004 or whatever. Seeing Sly 2 and instantly being magnetized to the art style and character designs. I repeatedly hammered this throughout my final videos in the trilogy. Sly was much more of a total package kind of game. I feel like Sly's gameplay model of pressing the circle button to automatically interact with ropes and spire jump points holds the series back in many ways. It makes the platforming very trivial, even in Thieves in Time where there's so much more of it and they do a lot more with it, it's hard to really get into the platforming like I could in other games from my childhood that I've also played a lot like Ratchet and Jack. Jumping and pressing the circle button has a 0% chance of failure and a generous range, barring my not being used to the physics of Thieves in Time. Something the first Sly has to its advantage over its sequels, speaking as someone who's played them all an uncountable amount of times, is replay value. Sure, Sly 1 has this problem of automation as well, but the difference is that the game was plenty challenging the first time around with its hit points and lives, but then it has the time trials where the gameplay model was based around absolute pixel-perfect runs that required in-and-out knowledge of the stage and every possible shortcut or way to go faster. For that reason, I now find Sly 1 the most mechanically compelling game in the series to play. I went over this at the end of the last Sly 3 video, and I had said that I'm not going to hold the relative ease of Sly 2 through 4 against the games too hard because you realize it wasn't an accident that the games were like this. I find Sly games quite easy because I have been obsessed with them for almost 20 years, but I could name countless missions that when actually playing them as a kid on PS2 left me stumped for a long time. A lot of those were minigames, but still. The Sly Cooper games were created to be challenging kids games that were fun for the whole family, and to that end, they succeeded. I could try speedrunning and that sort of thing, but I don't feel like Sly 2 through 4 are the kind of games where that would even be fun because of how many unskippable cutscenes you have to try and find a way around. As stated in the last Sly video, I ran the games into the ground and now it's hard for me to find them that fun to play, especially since mechanically they aren't offering much to the adult player that the more challenging platformers are, like say, Crash Bandicoot. So what's left then? Well, in the Sly Cooper trilogy, you had the story, which I think carried the entire experience and elevated every single aspect of the games, as I've been saying for years now. I went into this in last year's Sly 2 video. There are no other games with this unique heist setup gameplay model executed to such a fine degree with a compelling story on top of that, which makes the game live rent free in your head. The way every aspect of the experience worked in tandem to create a great game was something really special about that trilogy. So where does that leave Thieves in Time? Well, as I alluded to earlier, I have a new perspective on this game as a game, and like always, I like the writing even less than before, which I really didn't think was possible at this point. I think the story of Sly 4 is just... bad. I'm going to make this quick because at this point I've gone over these issues a hundred times and yet they manage to irk me more and more with each playthrough. And I'm up to nine playthroughs of this game at this point after ten years. First, you have the fact that the characters are significantly reduced in complexity compared to the original games. Sly's witty nature has turned into his entire character as he's to come up with some kind of witty line to barf out in every scene. What made him cool before was his quick wit, but also calm demeanor and determination to see his missions through and his care for his friends. He was a well-rounded character in all three games. Bentley made it out of this game relatively unscathed because the comedy that came from his character in the trilogy is largely how they write him in this game, and it's pretty entertaining for the most part. Specifically the deadpan sarcasm he gives out. The quips, not as much, but we can get to that later. Murray, though, was reduced to the muscle that's obsessed with food, something that, yes, happened before, but mostly in Sly 1, compared to this game where he mentions something about hunger and food pretty regularly and has this mediocre attempt at a character arc, where he finally discovers his usefulness after he can't climb an ice wall. A far cry from his trilogy-long arc about the very same thing from a much more genuine place of feeling useless compared to Sly and Bentley. And then, Carmelita is just awful in this game, going from the tough and badass cop busting criminals into, well as the game describes, the ex-girlfriend, where most of her character is dealing with her relationship with Sly and little else. Though, there really isn't much else for her to do in this time-traveling story anyway, given the fact that she can't be arresting people hundreds of years in the past. But regardless, I think this is a woeful showing for Carmelita, as she's only playable in like three missions across the entire campaign, and contributes so little to the story in the moment-to-moment -moment action that cutscenes like the Galath one after the rescue don't even feature her, despite being in the safe house where she is. Her inclusion and entire character design feels much more like fan service than anything else, and it shows when replaying this game. Especially considering the ways in which the media landscape has improved in the depictions of female characters in just the last 10 years alone. It just makes the laughably contrived setup of Carmelita having a belly dance to distract these guards in Episode 5 feel even more cringeworthy than it was 10 years ago. The plot has issues down to the fundamentals, as it's just built off the back of coincidences and contrivances. You need an item from that era to time travel, because that makes sense. 
But in order to do that, the story repeatedly contrived reasons for that to happen, like, ooh, the goons dropped a gold coin, guess that gets us to the next level, or thankfully, Carmelita just happened to have an ancient Arabian coin, now we're in business. Oh wow, what a coincidence, Carmelita got tossed into Le Paradox's time machine and just so happened to show up exactly where we were in time. The story is just littered with that sort of writing. Time travel doesn't actually exist, so you just have to make up how it works in whatever story you're telling, and my standards with this are not even that high. I accept the story of Avengers Endgame without even thinking much about how the mechanics of time travel actually work. But then, whenever I look at this game's story, it just makes my head implode from the fact that it's complete nonsense. Like how history is rewritten enough by Le Paradox's crew for the Thievius Raccoonus pages to disappear, but somehow Sly himself doesn't cease to exist. Or how Le Paradox legitimately rewrites history to make himself king of the world, but they still use an item from the unaltered timeline to return home? When it's clearly a new timeline, right? The world is saved by beating Le Paradox and he's arrested, but then, for what crime? Rewriting history? Wouldn't his entire scheme be wiped from history anyway? Hasn't the entire series been altered now? Things of that nature. And look, I'm trying to skim over this sort of thing right now, because I don't want to make a long nitpick compilation because it really isn't important. These aren't real issues that get in the way of the story. You could, for lack of a better phrase, cinema sins any story in existence if you really wanted to. The sheer number of potential plot holes a person could poke out of a plot doesn't really speak to that story's value and instead just shows how much free time I have. Plus, I've been over this a thousand times. I'm not interested in going over all the same negative talking points to the same level of depth as I have in the past because a roast of Thieves in Time isn't why I'm here, I'm just trying to express how I experience the story. I've thought about this six ways from Sunday and I always end up thinking the writing was worse than I remembered. I mean, if you look at this game as a legitimate continuation of the plot from the trilogy, then it fails for the reasons of characterization I mentioned before, but then the dramatic beats they introduce fall flat in their face, because they won, throw away compelling drama in 10 seconds like Carmelita learning Sly was lying, then build the entire game around Sly trying to regain her trust because he returned to thieving to save the future, which completely ignores his intention to do it before that even happened. But as time went on, the old itch came back, and I knew I needed to pull a heist. Thus rendering the entire drama moot from Sly's side because he's full of it. Or two, they contrive drama like Penelope betraying the gang in one level for reasons that don't make sense. I mean, she wants to get rich? They invented time travel. That seems like Nobel Peace Prize material to me. But then the entire plotline is introduced and wrapped in about 15 minutes and is not relevant to the characters again. It's a Sly game, so there's gotta be a Sly 2 level twist. But it just fails. But then I thought about it. Maybe Sly 4 was meant to be a comedic reunion of sorts, and when looking at it from that perspective, it makes the most sense, but I still think it fails. This was the area where the game's story went down in my estimation yet again. Thieves in Time, like many platformers from the mid-2010s, just bombards the players with attempts at humorous dialogue. In cutscenes, in gameplay, it doesn't matter. The game tries as hard as possible to be funny via pop culture references, Sly being weaponizably obnoxious in mission briefings, or just an onslaught of verbal diarrhea in gameplay. The Sly games were littered with dialogue from the beginning, but mostly tutorial-type dialogue and a lot of that spam was towards the beginning of the game. By the end, the mission starts, you play, and that's that. Here, the characters will comment on every random thing, or just trade quips like it's nobody's business. No way I'm going out as egg salad! Huh? 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 I'll never eat an omelet again! Hey, don't forget, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Ugh, I'd much rather sleep in late. Billy, what do you think we just skip breakfast? Yeah. My mom's eggs, actually. Sometimes cutting themselves off with more dialogue. Let me in, Sly. I can okay, drop the blood in the back and on that work thing. By hacking magic. It feels almost non-stop. And I don't think a single joke lands in this entire game. To get past this, here's what you can do. Go in the options and hit the dialogue volume slider and reduce it to absolute zero. Then, when a cutscene plays, pause and hit the skip button. During cutscenes that let you skip them, that is, because some don't. This is also what I did when I played this on the emulator. Genuinely, Sly 4 in 4K, decent load times and with no dialogue saw the game rise by several points in my estimation. But the annoying dialogue was yet another thing going against the game in my playthrough of it this time. But I would also like to wrap this up soon, so let's get to the point. 
To give Sly 4 shade for being a goofy kids game is unfair, I realize, because here's the fact I've come to terms with. Sly was always a cartoony kids game. I spent so long in the 2010s talking about the Sly trilogy as the most serious of Shakespearean art, but that's just not what it was ever meant to be. To seriously examine the themes of Sly Cooper, you just have to pretend this isn't a series where you play a game of Voodoo Simon Says, or cheat in the Lumberjack games by attaching bright yellow cables to Jean Besson's back to pull him off the rock climb and somehow have the judges not see this ridiculously obvious ruse. Or climb up giant Carmelita's bootlaces. I never thought Sly being for kids was a great defense for Thieves in Time when people used it in the past, because that just begs the question of why we're even playing it to begin with if it's above criticism on a story level, since I don't feel like the gameplay is compelling enough to keep us coming back on its own, but maybe I'm in the minority there. Perhaps many do think Sly's gameplay is what it's all about, I just don't. I now watch the dramas put out by AMC and HBO on all that, so it's much easier to see in hindsight that yeah, Sly was always a cartoony series for kids with wacky setups and characters. Sly 4 is no different in that sense. And that was something that was always a lot of fun in the OG trilogy. Like, I'm not saying the Lumberjack games are bad because it's so ridiculous and obvious. It's pretty funny. I enjoy it, and then it switches to serious a moment later. And this is the critical difference. While the Sly trilogy was targeting a younger audience, I feel like it was written in a more compelling fashion. The devil's in the details here. The dialogue in Thieves in Time isn't just trying to be funny constantly but it lacks the subtle humor the old games had in dialogue, or the deadpan nature of its humor. Any problems with that guy? Said he wanted to be buried in his mom's pasta sauce. Yeah, that's, uh, that's strange. Kids media can have the power to leave a massive impact on that target demographic, and I was an example of this with Sly. Sly was a character who spoke in an intelligent manner, the likes of which I had never heard before. It's a well-fortified, gothic nightmare that would make any thief run in terror. Terrible or not, that's where we're headed. Part of what made the script so memorable to me was how smart it sounded, which is why I know it so well today. The claw gang had been defeated, and the clockwork parts lay scattered around in heaps. Yet, despite the explosion, they remained pristine. It was as if nothing could ever hurt them. The trilogy, even with its target audience, naturally built character arcs from Game 1 to Game 3, letting players sit in the moments of victory and defeat. It was a well-told story. Maybe not the greatest story of all time, but a well-told story nonetheless. One that I find very endearing. One that I'd hope to show my own kids if I ever get to that point in life. And all of that is what I think is lacking in the fourth one. Dialogue just being more plain and obvious in comparison to what's come before. Thanks, guys! I guess this makes up for all my screw-ups lately. Murray, we all make mistakes. It happens. But it doesn't matter because we're a team and we all have each other's backs. That's why we're unbeatable. Yeah, what he said. Today, you were the hero, Murray. And don't you forget it. I think Sly had a limited shelf life and in hindsight didn't need to go past the third one. The whole message of Sly 3 was about moving on and letting go of things when the time was right. In retrospect, I kind of think the time travel sequel hook was a mistake. The fact that this story has to contrive almost every plot point is further evidence that perhaps there was something incredibly unnatural about a time traveling Sly game. The series was better left as that complete story than get to go on for the sake of going on and ending on what I believe is one of the worst endings in a video game. A cliffhanger that has gone unresolved for 10 years and in my opinion never will be resolved. Apparently, Sony promised Sanzaro they'd get to do DLC and provide a conclusion for the story, but just never followed up. PS3 era Sony did some weird stuff and screwed over a lot of developers like that. But that's not really important here. I said in the last Sly 3 video that when the game was released, the target audience didn't get the message of Sly 3, and of course we didn't. The target audience was like 6 to 10. The fanbase wanted to see that time travel sequel hook be brought to life, and here it is. But another thing I've realized is that... I failed to learn the lesson of Sly 3 even more so after Sly 4 than I ever did before. Now we get to one of my video ending rambles, so buckle up. I already told the story from the game's release that led to my review of it in 2016. But on that day, I intended for that to be the end of the story and I'd move on. As for myself, I think this will be my first and last time making a video on this game. But then, later in 2016, I began to re-review the trilogy for the first time. In this series, I had the goal of using my more in-depth framework to see how the trilogy holds up in comparison to the criticisms I gave Sly 4 in the review. However, this goal quickly transformed from something meant to provide additional context to those criticisms into using Sly 4 as a comedic scapegoat at every turn imaginable, as a substitute for having something interesting to say. 
My Sly 3 review from Spring 2017 is a perfect example. I never brought up Sly 4 in a serious capacity in that video. It was instead a constant barrage of jabs and jokes at its expense. What a terrible storyline. Like, seriously, what happened? The Paradox just jumps off the blimp and gets hit in the face of the plane? You've got to be kidding me. Oh, wait, I'm talking about Sly 4 again. Hating Sly 4 became a core tenet of my personality on YouTube and off of YouTube, I won't lie. This went on for a long time. Even after I was long done covering Sly, I still went out of my way to tear into it as often as humanly possible. Like this example from my Sonic Heroes review from 2020. But certainly that's something I feel like making a big stink about. After all, this game isn't Sly 4. Yeah, don't bother coming up with an interesting way to make a point, just bash Sly 4. That's an easy segue, right? It was incredibly lazy and predictable on my part. I mentioned at the start that I only reviewed Sly 4 the one time, but it wouldn't seem like that since I used every chance I had to undermine it. Not just bringing it up in countless videos as the never-ending bad example, but then also contriving videos into existence for the purpose of putting it down, like podcasts, retrospecting the series, used to make fun of the game yet again. One of ten things that suck about Sly Cooper Thieves in Time? Well, here you go or that deleted Sly 4 is non-canon video. And one time we were joking about how the only way we'd be happy is if Sly 4 was just wiped clean from the canon so we'd never have to worry about it or its stupid cliffhanger ending ever again. Which sent us down a rabbit hole of inconsistencies that all but confirmed that the Sly Cooper of the original trilogy and the Sly Cooper of Thieves in Time are not one in the same. You could say we were stating a case and giving evidence, but it was more than anything else an attempt to make fun of this game. Then there were live streams done to take the piss out of the game, and the list goes on, really. But that extended to also using the developer, Sanzaru Games, as a comedic scapegoat as well. This is the most important thing. Sly 4 is just a game. It'll live. But Sanzaru is a group of people who work hard in the things they do. For me, to engender an attitude of belittling them in my audience is behavior I cannot rationalize or justify. The best I can do is tell you that a lot of beginning YouTubers fall into the cliché trap of making a game developer or a game their arch enemy in their videos. A cringeworthy and outdated trope. I wanted to make Sanzaru for me what LJN was for the angry video game nerd. Key difference is that the AVGN is clearly supposed to be a hyperbolic character, not a genuine reflection of how James feels and acts, when I had no such pretense on my channel. He was also raging on dumb licensed games from at the time, 20 to 25 years ago. I mobilized people to hate in the developer that currently exists, and if any hate ever reached the eyes and ears of the people who work at Sanzaru, I'm sorry, and I always was the one who was in the wrong. Obsessing with hating this game both because I thought it was fun and because it became such a routine in my show that I thought it had to continue. Until I saw, following the release of my Sonic 06 review in 2020, just how hated and how infamous I was for this in particular. Known for hating a relatively obscure game that most people like. I earned that criticism, and from that day forward I never did it again. Not a single one of my videos in 2021, 2022, and right now possess a random rant at the expense of Sly 4. Some of them even using it as a positive example, like the re-review of Secret Agent Clank. And speaking of which, in the original cut of that video from summer 2021, I had addressed this very issue. However, I later removed it before that video was released because of the fact that I thought, only six months or so removed from when I first saw how much people hated this routine of mine, that an apology from me would seem performative. So I decided to just let my actions speak louder than words. So like I said, I owe Sanzaro an apology for bashing them as much as I did. I'm now an adult, not a dumbass teen, and I was going to act like it. Maybe that cut was a mistake since I'm still known for that amongst many people online who still hate me with everything they've got based purely on things like the Sly 4 hate and other incidents that are absolutely my fault. And also things that never happened that they made up, that's neither here nor there. My point is, in the years that have passed, I learned the truth. On the matter of Sly 4, my behavior has been utterly abysmal and I'm here to set the record straight today. I'm sorry to Sanzaru, Glenn Egan and Matt Kramer specifically. I'm responsible for creating an enormous amount of fighting in the Sly community. As far as I can tell, my review opened the floodgates on people hating this game, and my non-canon video is the first time that discussion ever happened, and the fanbase discourse still has to deal with that to this day. And that video didn't even get that many views. Perhaps I wasn't responsible for these things, maybe it was somebody else's video I haven't seen. And more importantly, if I hadn't done it, somebody else no doubt would have. Which means it is less about me and more about internet discourse, but the person happened to be me and I feel like my conduct in those years after the game's release was bad and I want to apologize for it, and here we are. But then, that's the question. Have I learned to love Sly 4? Well, the answer to that is... not really. That's why the title has a question mark in it. No, it's more accurate to say that in becoming an adult, I learned to just stop giving a damn. 
Sly 4 is a well-made game with some of the finest animation I've seen in a cartoony game. It's polished to a mirror shine, it's got a truckload of content and variety, it was a clear labor of love from all involved. Sly Cooper Thieves in Time is a decent game. Hell, I can even say it's a good game at the end of the day, but it's not for me, it never was, and it never will be. I think it's an extremely disappointing and mediocre follow-up to the things I loved about the Sly Cooper trilogy, however, that trilogy will always exist for me to go back to whenever I feel the need, which will no doubt be a long time from now, I imagine. But moreover, Sly doesn't belong to me. I don't get to decide what Sly is, so now that Thieves in Time is 10 years old and has no sequel, I'm laying this thing to rest. I'm done hating it. It's over. It's just a video game. Hell, I may even revisit it every couple of years and play it with no dialogue and on an emulator and have a fine time. Even if I think the idea of a Sly 4 was a bad one, and I think the one we got wasn't anything like what I wanted, I'm just done making videos about these games until something new comes out and gives me something new to actually say. But in the meantime, do I think Sly will return? I can't imagine Sly never coming back. I mean, we do live in a culture ruled by nostalgia, after all. So I don't think it's impossible, but I am confident, almost certain, that we will never get a sequel to Sly Cooper Thieves in Time, which only becomes more true as time goes on. If Sly returns, it would no doubt be some kind of Crash-styled remake or Ratchet-styled reboot. People remember the trilogy, not really the reunion special eight years later. The sales figures on Thieves in Time backing that up. But even creatively, I think the ending of Sly 4 is a genuine dead end. I mean, you have to involve time travel to wrap up the cliffhanger of Sly 4, and at that point, is Sly now a sci-fi time-traveling series now? Or do you quickly rescue Sly and pivot towards Penelope as the main villain? Which is another terrible idea? Or would it have some time skip to Sly's son or something else? I just think Sly 5 is a conceptual nightmare, and the series' story is going nowhere in particular, so it's best to just start over. That's just how I feel about it. Every year, Sly discourse is consumed by stupid fake leaks for Sly 5, and they become more implausible with time. All I know is, whatever happens, I'll be there because Sly will never stop being an important part of my life as a game enthusiast and entertainer. So it's better off that I just accept that fact and move on. Not away from Sly, but towards other things. Because it will always be with me. And thankfully, I've seemingly inspired a lot of other people to try it too. The comment section has revealed that my videos on Sly and my constant quotes from the series and other videos has piqued the curiosity of the audience who had never tried it and the ones who have really liked it. That's something for me to be proud of. I've spread the love of Sly Cooper to more people who can play and replay the games to get the joy I've gotten out of them now that I have admittedly run it into the ground myself. So speaking for myself, I'm going to keep talking about Sly whenever relevant in videos because this franchise will never stop being important to me. It'll never not be a source of unforgettable memories and moments. The highs and the lows, the heroic moments, funny moments, or even sad ones. I remember me and my sister reenacting the lemonade bar scene in Sly 3. And there was no way I didn't wet the bed that night. Or how we used to play the cops in robbers mode from the multiplayer again and again. I was the kind of kid who would turn off the console before letting the screen say that I lost. That kind of stuff. It may be a long time before I play these games again, but all I can say for now is just that the Sly Cooper trilogy is one of my favorite things to ever exist. Whether I play them all the time, or only once every few years going forward, and that's all that really matters. And I'm glad I've gotten the chance to paint that picture one last time. So to close the video, I'll say what I always do. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.